Folks, the, the live stream is going to start in just a moment. The recording is going to go on. Mayor, give it about 10 seconds and you'll be good to go. Yeah. Uh, actually, Mayor, if you can hold on just a moment, it looks like Jeff might be having a, an issue. Oh, Jeff, are you still okay? Jeff Miller, are you okay? You're muted, sir. Jeff, you're muted. It seems like I'm joining now, but they must have changed the software or made some kind of adjustments. I'm not sure, but I'm in now. Okay, thank you, sir. Mayor, sure. when you are. I'm ready. Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to the July 13th Matthews Board of Commissioners meeting. Uh, this will be our regular meeting. We didn't have an early meeting tonight. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that due to Mecklenburg County's COVID-19 stay-at-home order, this meeting of the Matthews Board of Commissioners will be conducted remotely using the Zoom virtual meeting platform. The Town of Matthews is committed to transparency and robust public participation during these challenging times. I'll remind uh, the commissioners that when we vote on each item, it'll be by a roll call vote meaning each member will be polled to individually state their vote for the record and also raise their hand or otherwise indicate uh, visually how they're voting. So with that being said, we'll move on. Uh, tonight we have Universal Society of Hinduism President Rajan Zed to give our moment of reflection. Mr. Zed, sir. Thanks, uh, Mayor Higdon and the Board of Commissioners for having me. I shall be reading in Sanskrit from ancient Sanskrit scriptures, some as old as 1500 BCE, and then interpret in English. Om Bur Bubahasvaha Tat Savitur Varenayam Bargo Devasadimahi Diyoyona Prachodayat. We meditate on the transcendental glory of the deity supreme who is inside the heart of the earth inside the life of the sky and inside the soul of the heaven. May he stimulate and illuminate our minds. Astoma sadgamya, tamsoma jyotir gamya, mrityor mamratam gamya. Lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness to light. Lead us from death to immortality. Tasmada sakta statam karyam karma samachara. Sakto Hyacharan Karma Parma Bhnauti Purusha Karma Neva Hi Samsidhi Mastita Jankadeya Loka Sangreha Meva Pi Sampashankar Tumrahasi Strive constantly to serve the welfare of the world by devotion to selfless one attains the supreme goal of life do your work with the welfare of others always in mind Om Saha Navavatu Saha Nobunaktu Saha Viryan Karba Bahai May we be protected together. May we be nourished together. May we work together with great vigor. May our study be enlightening. May no obstacle arise between us. Samni vakuti, samna hirdyani va, samna vastu vo mano, yathava susahasti. United your resolve, united your hearts. May your spirits be at one that you may long together dwell in unity and conquered. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Om. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zed. We'll move on to agenda item number three. We'll say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge mm -hmm. allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, with liberty, <laughs> indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Before we move on to the next agenda item, I want to uh, announce that we have a, a special guest with us tonight, uh, former president and CEO of Novant Health um, Matthews Medical Center, Roland Bebo. Hello, Roland. Good evening. And it is uh, my great honor 
on behalf of the governor tonight to present you with the Old North State Award, which is one of the highest awards that a civilian can be honored with in the state of North Carolina. And the little uh, uh, script at the top says, for dedication and services beyond expectation and excellence to the, to the great state of North Carolina and on behalf of the citizens of this state, I, meaning the governor, Roy Cooper, bestow upon Roland R. Bebo the Old North State Award. Congratulations, Roland. Well deserved, my friend. I'd like to say a few words. I would. Thank you, Mayor. First of all, uh, I want to thank leadership of the town, certainly starting with the mayor, uh, both past and president. present. And I, I must say, um, I've just been blessed to be part of an amazing team at Navon Health Matthews Medical Center and uh, all the partners within the community. Uh, as you know, it, it's great to be the face of something if, if everything's going great and if it's not going so great, uh, obviously it's still to be the face of the organization. So I do wanna give a shout out to all, all the team members at Matthews Medical Center and the leadership team that I spelt, uh, spent 12 years there. Uh, and obviously the response from the citizens of uh, Mecklenburg County and the utilization of our services at the, at the hospital. So it, it definitely is my honor and uh, certainly very humbled to, to receive such, such an award. And as, as we said a few weeks ago, um, I, I was so fortunate not to only receive one key of the town of Matthews, but two. One certainly for myself personally, as well as uh, for the medical center. So thank you, Mayor, for, for taking time out of the busy agenda that you have and running the town and for this uh, amazing recognition. I'll definitely remember it for the, for the rest of my life. Well, fantastic. And I know I, I speak on behalf of many Matthews residents and certainly all the people, officials from the, from the town that are on this call tonight. We. Uh, uh, Welcome you back at any time. I understand you're still in Charlotte right now. So uh, anytime you want to stop by for a coffee or lunch or a, a glass of wine, you're always welcome. I always like to catch up with you, Colin. Best of luck to you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Same to everyone on the call tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Rob. Before we move on to the next item, I think I was remiss in not introducing the folks that are uh, on the call tonight. So I'll go back and do that. Uh, we have Commissioner Dave Bland, uh, our town attorney, Charlie Buckley, Mayor Pro Tem Renee Garner, Commissioner Larry Whitley in his police uniform tonight, highway patrol uniform, Commissioner John Urban, Town Manager Hazen Blodgett, Assistant Town Manager Becky Hawk, Commissioner Ken McCool, Commissioner Jeff Miller, and we have a uh, few other town employees, town clerk, Lori Canapino doesn't have her camera on. Uh, some others are, are, are coming on. Our uh, planning director, Jay Camp, uh, chief of police, Clark Pennington, and our fire and EMS chief, Rob Kennenberg. So thank you. I'm sorry if I missed anyone else, but I want, I want to make sure I introduced you. Uh, we'll go on to item number four. I want to take just a moment to recognize our friends in our sister city, St. Maxime. Uh, who on the current uh, board has been there? Jeff, you've been. Yes, sir. Uh, and and Hazen, Hazen, our town manager. Uh, we have a sister city, St. Maxime, France, and I want to recognize them and uh, recognize their friendship and also that tomorrow that they will celebrate Bastille Day. And Bastille Day is very similar to our own Independence Day it uh, marks the beginning of the French Revolution when the uh, people in Paris stormed the Bastille, which was a, a large fortress that had uh, some political prisoners and gunpowder and ammunition and other things, and it kind of started the French Revolution. So uh, we want to wish our friends in St. Maxime a very happy Bastille Day. I'm sure they'll have a lot of fireworks and parades similar to what we do here on July 4th. So I wanted to uh, pass along our good wishes. Next, I'd like to move on to agenda item number five, uh, present a proclamation and recognition of the Matthews Police Department. Uh, we are, we are uh, currently experiencing some um, very difficult times. There's a lot of uh, 
uh, racial tensions in our community and in the state and in the country. Also, uh, with COVID-19, our, our police employees are under a lot of pressure, a lot of stress. And we wanted to make, the, uh, make an effort to show uh, our Matthews police employees how much we appreciate them and that we, that we have their back and that uh, they're, they're great folks and we really appreciate them. I would like to say, I would like to uh, give some credit here that we were looking for a public way to show our appreciation. It was Commissioner Urban that suggested a proclamation. Um, I will tell, I'm gonna present this to Chief Pennington and uh, I had the great honor of, of visiting with all the shifts a, a week before last, all the shifts of our police employees and got to personally tell them how much we appreciate them. I wanna present this proclamation tonight and uh, I just want any, any of our police employees that may be listening uh, as well as a chief to know how difficult this was to write with seven authors because we went through several revisions of this and I think we got it right, but our, our heart is in the right place. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and read this, uh, proclaim this to our community and to our, especially to our police employees. Whereas we, the town of Matthews, mayor and board of commissioners recognize the important conversations about racial justice and the scrutiny of police department policies and actions that are occurring across the country. And whereas we know the Matthews Police Department stands firmly with us against racism, bigotry, and hate in any form, and whereas we support the Matthews Police Department's commitment to transparency and open dialogue, as well as ensuring safe and equitable treatment for all community members and police officers alike, whereas Matthews Police Chief Clark Pennington has demonstrated this commitment by publicly responding and discussing the department's policies and direct directives related to these topics, including internal affairs protocols related to both compliant and disciplinary procedures, the Office of Professional Standards, including departmental training, use of force protocols and de-escalation techniques and hiring practices among other topics. And whereas this commitment to continuous improvement is further evidenced by the department's ongoing work to align all policies and practices with the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, CALEA, standards and 21st century policing strategies, including the planned formation of a chief's advisory committee. And whereas Matthews police officers demonstrate professionalism on a daily basis as they perform their duties with compassion, integrity and respect for all citizens, and the department is a model for other law enforcement agencies and a source of great pride for the entire Matthews community. Now, therefore be it proclaimed that we, as the mayor and board of commissioners wish to publicly thank the men and women of the Matthews Police Department for the commendable service they provide to our community on a daily basis and extend to them our sincerest support, respect and gratitude for their commitment to making Matthews a better place. And um, myself and all the commissioners will sign this document, Clark, and, and officially present it to you. So thank you very much. Uh, Chief Pennington, if you would like to say a few words, you're welcome. I would, thank you, Mayor. Uh, on behalf of all the men, women, uh, for the Matthews Police Department and our sworn civilian and volunteer ranks. I mean, this means so much to us. I think that uh, the public uh, proclamation of, of the appreciation that you show for the for us uh, coming from our elected officials means just so much. So we do thank you for taking the time. I know it was difficult when you have seven authors, but I think after speaking with each of you, it was easy in the presence of you wanted to express that appreciation. So for that, I do thank you. And, and uh, we look forward to working with you guys. Fantastic. Thank you. I, I would uh, also like to say that we had a, a wee bit of help from staff in crafting this proclamation. So uh, <laughs> not quite that good at authoring. So I want to thank uh, Becky Hawk and, and Maureen Keith as well for helping craft this. But it really was a, a uh, effort of love and, and appreciation. So thank you very much, Chief. We'll move on now to our next agenda item. I'm sorry. Somebody say something. Okay. We'll move on to item six, receive an update on COVID-19 emergency operations from our emergency operations center commander, Rob Kinberg. Uh, good evening, mayor, uh, council. Uh, today is uh, day 125 of COVID related activity here in Mecklenburg County. Uh, our current counts as of six o'clock tonight uh, the county has experienced 14,739 cases, 168 deaths, 
Uh, 29 continuing care facilities are listed as being in outbreak status. Uh, over the last two weeks, we have seen um, both the good and the bad. Uh, cases have increased at the same rate as the previous two weeks at 34%, um, which is slightly slower than the average we've seen over the last several months. Uh, but because of the numbers we're dealing with, each day brings a larger daily case increase. Uh, deaths, fortunately, have increased at a much slower rate, only about 10%. Uh, on average, 3,500 people are being tested each day uh, with about a 10% positive result. Uh, so that gives us 350 additional people to the rolls each day. Um, about uh, The hospitals are experiencing about a 32% increase in hospitalizations. And on Friday, Atrium hit their peak number of COVID patients in residence at the hospital. Uh, the social distancing index for Mecklenburg County has seen slight improvement uh, with the governor's mask order, uh, which is a positive sign. Uh, currently here in the town of Matthews, 113 residents are in isolation. Uh, approximately 70 have been in isolation and have dropped off the rolls. Uh, Royal Park remains one of the facilities in outbreak status, according to the state. Um, Matthews, Charlotte, and Mecklenburg County did enter into a joint proclamation, which we'll talk about in just a minute, uh, reinforcing the wearing of face coverings as a way to slow the spread of COVID-19. Uh, the counties, hospitals, and volunteer group, we refer to them as the VOAD, uh, are working on a mass distribution plan for 2 million masks across the county. And Matthews has asked to be an integral part of that plan. Uh, on the downside with increased testing, turnaround time for most tests have increased to five to eight days. And test vendors are again asking the hospitals to prioritize their testing or their patients that are being tested. Uh, emergency services staffing is being stressed due to uh, potential exposures coupled with the summer holidays. Um, the big questions for this week are, are we sliding backwards toward another shutdown? I think we're, we're looking at the experience of our Southern neighbors, uh, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida uh, trying to make some predictions about where things are going to go here in North Carolina. Uh, next question is, what's going to happen with school? Uh, the governor is expected to release his plan later this week. And the still unending question is, when will bars, gyms, and the like be allowed to reopen? So we are still wrestling with those questions on a daily basis. Uh, our activity remains basically the same. Uh, we are involved on a countywide effort each day. Um, we are documenting uh, exposures, burn rates for equipment, and affected employees on a daily basis. Uh, we continue to participate in centralized warehousing for protective equipment. Uh, we've made regular contact with our congregant living facilities, and uh, we have representation in the EOC on a daily basis. So that is my report. Thank you, Rob. Are there any questions for Chief Kinneberg? Uh, yes, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Um, have you had any more incidents in the fire department or in the police department of cases? Or are you? Uh, yes, we have. We've had, uh, I can't speak for the police department. Uh, Chief Pennington may be able to. Uh, we've had a few cases of members testing positive. Uh, most of those are not job related. Um, uh, they, they're social spread, uh, community spread related. Um, we are being very cautious in putting employees uh, out while or in isolation while we await test results or the 14 day period. Uh, we have been in touch with the county's county public health director's department's medical director to get the best advice we can about when we should test and when we should release people from isolation so that we can keep staffing 
levels appropriate. And without going too in depth into exposures of individuals, I will say we have had a few that have been exposed, uh, none positive, if I am correct to this point. However, I will say that some of our numbers and our residents, the number of residences that are testing positive inside of the town of Matthews has increased slightly. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for either of our chiefs? I would uh, just like to add for informational purposes, I have been uh, having discussions with uh, CMS uh, Chairperson Elise Stashu about what their plans are. Of course, I think everyone, is, as Rob said, is, is waiting for the governor's uh, leadership or, or directive. But essentially, CMS is looking at three possibilities, uh, not going back to school and having all everything online, doing a hybrid model where they teach the children in shifts so the class sizes are smaller, uh, or the last one would be just go back to school as normal, have everybody go back in one, one time. And I believe what CMS is planning for right now is the hybrid model because they can shift to either of the other two pretty quickly from that. But uh, logistically, it's uh, quite an undertaking as you might imagine. So uh, we're all eagerly waiting to see uh, what the governor is gonna suggest that we do going forward. I think there probably will be some, some sort of kids going back to school, I suspect, but we'll have to wait and see. The other thing I wanted to uh, follow up on with uh, part of uh, Chief Kinnenberg's presentation is the uh, joint resolution between Charlotte and Mecklenburg, um, Charlotte and Matthews, clarifying face covering requirements in town owned or leased buildings. Um, I did uh, sign this uh, Saturday, uh, Chief Kinnenberg brought it over to my house. This uh, essentially is an amendment to what we agreed to previously, that yes, we support wearing masks and this um, extends protection to our town employees and our citizens uh, when they conduct business within uh, town owned buildings and facilities or leased facilities. So does anybody have any questions about this? I sent you an email regarding this uh, several days ago and there are 15 uh, different exceptions to the order. So it's not overly rigorous, but would prevent someone, for instance, from going up to the tax office without a mask on and um, or interacting with other of our town employees without wearing a mask in town owned facilities. Okay, no uh, conversation on that. We'll move on to the next agenda item. Uh, Mr. Town Manager, are there any items to be added to the agenda? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, no, sir, Mr. Mayor. All right, we'll move on to public comment. Lori, do you want to handle this section? Uh, yes, give me one moment. Jay, if you could um, bring up the timer too, please. We have three public comment speakers tonight. We're going to start with Pastor McLean Faw from Joy Christian Fellowship Church, and I will bring him over in just a moment. Lori, is the gallery view available tonight? I'm not finding it. Uh, yes, sir. You should be able to get that from your own side. You can change that to speaker view or gallery view on your own computer. That's, that's what I've learned in the past, but tonight it's not available. So I'll, I'll keep playing around with it or figure it out or just deal with it. Thank you. You're welcome. Pastor Fawn, if you could um, unmute yourself and un and put on your camera, please. Uh, if you're able to. I'm trying to get my camera on. I don't seem to be working. It's okay if you can't, sir. Lori, do you want me to display the timer on the screen? Um, actually, can you display the proclamation itself, Jay? Okay. I'm sorry, I can't seem to get a, a picture. Uh, That's okay, Pastor Faw. Okay. Am I coming through? Uh... Yes, sir. We can hear you. Okay. You're welcome to begin. Thank you. When you're uh, ready. This is a, a resolution of peace and justice. Um, Pastor Leon Three was going to help me uh, tonight with this presentation, but he was unable to join me. He's out of town. He was actually one of the drafters of this proposal. Um, and I was one of the signers, 
um, I think it speaks to the to the hurt, to the woundedness in our nation um, on all sides. And uh, I really thought it was a, a very balanced statement. So I want to read this. We, the undersigned shepherds, pastors, and clergy of the Charlotte-Mecklenburg region and citizens of the state of North Carolina, hereby resolve and affirm the worth, dignity, and humanity of all those who live, work, and serve in our community. That is, such the, uh, that is just the heart of the whole resolution right there. Uh, we uphold and defend the constitutional right of our citizens to redress their grievances in an orderly, lawful, and peaceful fashion. Re we resolve that the elected officials of our city, county, and state would ensure would ensure and require that any and all protests and demonstrations be conducted in a lawful and peaceful fashion as to not recklessly endanger the lives and property, property of our citizens, nor needlessly jeopardize the safety of our law enforcement. We also resolve that those elected representatives would uphold and respect the liberties, speech, and rights of all the citizens with no biases or partialities to any given group or political persuasion. We further resolve and communicate our sincere gratitude to the law enforcement family for their courageous, selfless sacrifices in an earnest effort to ensure the safety and protection of all the citizens and their property in our community. We also determine that the law enforcement family is a vital, significant, and important part of our community and deserves our utmost respect and honor. We oppose any efforts, actions, or policies implemented by our elected city, county, or state representatives to defund law enforcement. We believe such efforts would needlessly restrict, limit, and hinder police from achieving their sworn duties of protecting and serving our communities, thereby diminishing the safety and welfare of our citizens. We, the undersigned, also resolve and affirm our, our unyielding commitment and devotion to all the citizens of our city, the spiritual, emotional, and physical well-being of all the residents of our state and nation is dear to us and remains to our mission and charge as shepherds, pastors, and clergy, respectfully written and executed. Thank you, Mr. Fall. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. Mayor, thank you, uh, commissioners, uh, for allowing this to be read and uh, submitted tonight. Our next speaker is Mr. Jerry Withrow. Mr. Withrow, there you go. Uh, we're going to do an audible timer tonight, so we'll let you know when the four minutes is up, sir. Thank you. you may begin when you're ready. Yes. This is in response to agenda item Eastwood Forest code violations. I spoke to the uh, to the council last month about this. So my name is Jerry Withrow and I am a property owner in Eastwood Forest in Matthews. So I want to thank code enforcement officer Carla McCoy and town commissioner Jeff Miller for taking their time to meet with me at Eastwood Forest this past month. Mr. McCoy and Mr. Miller personally observed the deplorable conditions of several of the lots that we looked at together in Eastwood Forest. We discussed how the many fine people who do live in Eastwood Forest could benefit from getting these few junky properties cleaned up. I hope that Mr. McCoy's and Mr. Miller's efforts to correct the code violations in Eastwood Forest will be effective and will be supported by the entire town council. Not only will it benefit Eastwood Forest, but it will also benefit the entire town of Matthews. Those are my comments, and I think you'll hear more about the agenda item when it comes up at Eastwood Forest Code Violations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Withrow. Okay. Our next speaker is Margie Owens. Ms. Owens is uh, phoning in. Ms. Owens, yes, we are ready to go when you are, ma'am. 
Okay, I also you know, I appreciate very much anything that, that you could do, y'all could do for us down here in this Eastwood Forest Mobile Home Park. Uh, but it just the people that live in here, a lot of them are good people, but then we got these people that just don't care. We're tired of all these, these empty mobile homes. They're just places where the drug drug houses, you know, and the homeless people, but it's the people that always want to go out and steal and you name it. And, uh, and the people that's just, they bring in all kind of clutter, just piling the yards up. They got cars and stuff. I mean, this one house in front of me's got like four cars out in the yard. It's not even used in the front yard. Just sit there year after year. I mean, it looks so trashy. Uh, they don't know how to take their trash cans in. They sit out there on the side of the road the whole week at a time. Some of them's got four and five cans and not supposed to have but one of each. And and they just don't they don't care. I mean, they just so trashy. And it'd be nice if there'd be some rules to be set around here where people can start, you know, cleaning up a little more, making it look nicer, you know, for the people that do care in here. Now, anything y'all could do for us to help us out to get rid of all these, these empty trailers that people just, you know, staying in and running out stealing and, you know, doing drugs and then the cars jumped all in the yards and they go out uh, dumpster diving and uh, come home, bring all kind of stuff home you would not believe. The three trailers is just in front of me. It's, it's got stuff piled all over the yards, the front, the back, where they just go and get stuff from them dumpsters and stuff and then bring it and throw it all over the yard, and that's where it stays. And then these junky cars, like I say, we, we're just desperate. We, we we need somebody to help us out and start setting some rules and make people do better about getting rid of all this junk in their yard and Getting the trash out at a decent time and using as many cans as they're supposed to, not five or six of them. And it'd be so nice. Anything y'all could help us to do down here in this mobile home park and make it look better for the people in here that are decent. It makes it look so trashy. It just looks like the whole trailer park is trash, but it's not. And you know, if you just ride all around the whole trailer park, you'll see what I mean. And all the stuff that people got, you know, piled in their yards and have trashed up. It is. There needs to be some rules and uh, you know, that one man that owns a bunch of cars, he's just a slum over. He don't care. He just rents. He don't pass no rules. He don't make people do nothing. Hand me my money every month. Now, I appreciate anything y'all could do. I'm not, I guess that's about it. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Owens. We appreciate your comments. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye. Lori, do we have any additional people? People that wish to make a public comment? And no, we don't, Mr. Mayor. All right, let's move on to agenda item number nine, recess the regular meeting for public hearings on applications to amend the unified development ordinance and land use map of the town of Matthews. So moved. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Whitley. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Commissioner McCool. We'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Bland, how do you vote, sir? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Yes. Commissioner Whitley? Yes. Commissioner Urban? Yes. Commissioner McCool? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. And I vote affirmative as well, so that passes unanimously. We'll move on to agenda item 9A, zoning application 2020-710 Inner Peaks to change the text in the UDO table 505.2-7 to add P under the B dash three zoning district to allow indoor commercial recreation not otherwise listed as a permitted use in the B3 zoning district continued from June 8, 2020. Um, Mr. I don't know, Jay Camp, are you gonna take this or Mr. Will? I'll, I'll be taking this one, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the board. Um, Inner Peaks Climbing Center is requesting a change in the table of uh, 505.2 to allow the use indoor commercial recreation not otherwise listed as a permitted use in the B3 zoning district. However, on July 1st, the applicant requested withdrawal of the text amendment application and at this for at this time. Uh, staff <coughs> recommends that the request be withdrawn at this time and um, it has been communicated that Inner Peaks will be um, pursuing this uh, at a later date. Okay, I will entertain a motion to um, withdraw this application. So 
moved, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Urban to have a second. Second by Commissioner Bland. We'll do a roll call vote again. Commissioner Bland? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Yes. Commissioner Whitley? Yes. Commissioner Urban? Yes. Commissioner McCool? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. I vote affirmative as well, so that passes unanimously. That will be withdrawn. Thank you, Rob. Let's move on to uh, 9B, Zoning Application 202711, Christ Life Church, to change the conditions in that certain BHCD district located at 1641 Matthews Township Parkway and being the Christ Life Church property and further designated as tax parcels 193-292-23 and 23E to allow ballrooms, banquets, or meeting slash catering halls as a permitted use. This also was continued from June 8th. Mary Jo. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, board members. Um, yes, this uh, application had been continued because of uh, the applicant's concern with having meetings for um, due to COVID-19. So this evening, um, we're moving forward with the request. They are asking for a change in conditions from um, existing BHCD to additional um, BHCD. The property is located um, at 1641 Matthews Township Parkway. Um, you'll see the star on the zoning map. That is in front of Pace's um, apartments and um, adjacent to um, Aqua Tots and um, across the street from a uh, portion of Novant Health. Um, the property, the building has a dry cleaner in it and the rest of the building is an existing vacant building. It used to be the hub. Next slide, please, Jay. Um, this shows you the aerial of the building um, highlighted in red. Again, uh, Aqua Tots and uh, Premier Plastics is to the left and then the apartments are to the back. The applicant is proposing to have a banquet, a catering hall um, in the portion of the building that was previously held by the pub. Next slide, please. Um, again, this is the original site information um, that McLeod Investment Corporation had originally developed the 5.44 acres. Uh, First Watch, Aqua Tots Hub and the dry cleaners are in there. And um, the existing building and parking will be utilized for the proposed new businesses. In 1993, the property was rezoned from R20 to BHCD um, and was a general development plan and minor adjustments would be allowed is what the um, original rezoning stated. Here's a couple views of the property. Again, the four areas where you see the glass to the left of the hub is where the where they'll be using um, and the parking and site plan is also shown uh, again no changes to um, the layout of the parking or the existing building next slide please these are some proposed interior plans for serving um, catering and banquet halls these are different options that the applicant may propose on the interior um, zoning has no control as to what happens on the interior. The only concern we have is with parking. Next slide, please. Uh, retail will continue on the parcel as the dry cleaner. All landscaping screening and required buffers shall, remain, shall meet the ordinance if there's any additional requirements that need to be submitted. Uh, the request is the change in use to ballroom, banquet, or meeting hall, catering hall. Um, the table of permitted uses is attached at the end of this presentation. Staff has highlighted some uh, additional ones that we feel should be um, removed from the table of permitted uses. Uh, the applicant went through these uses originally and crossed off the ones that they felt they did not want to have um, left on the use chart. Next slide, please. And um, the development is in accordance with the land use plan. Um, it's the streetscape will remain. They're preserving the mature trees that are along there. 
promote mixed use development and plan business parks is, uh, and this fits that um, and prohibit strip commercialization. So they're not adding to any strip commercialization. Uh, this rezoning request, if approved um, for the new use, could complement area existing businesses such as Novant Hospital um, for a facility to have a small banquet room or teaching facility um, that no, does not currently exist in the area. Next slide, please. There were no comments from staff departments and uh, cross access parking agreement is already in place. And um, they held a community meeting on June 21st. Uh, no neighboring property owners attended and there were no meeting, no meeting comments. Next slide. Do we have the permitted use chart? Yeah, give me one moment. That's uh, it's on the website, I think. Yes, sir. And the applicant is here this evening, um, Mr. Z Zizos, um, if, there, if there's any questions after um, we look at the chart. Mary Jo? Yes. While we're waiting to bring up the um, permitted uses, et cetera, uh, you said it's shared parking, so there's no concern. Um, I, I'm familiar with that area, and uh, there's no concern with uh, the parking requirements, correct? Correct. The, um, the layout, there's 37 parking spaces in that lot. Um, so they could have um uh just a second a hundred seats easily um because there's one one parking space per three seats on that okay, okay. and are they responsible at all i saw in some of the notes about the landscape buffer along uh uh the parkway they're not responsible for changing any of that correct Correct. There's nothing that needs to be changed. I did notice last week when I was there, there was some dead limbs or a dead tree around the area. But other than that, uh, no, there's no additional landscaping that needs to be installed, if that's what you're asking. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. We need a caterer or a banquet hall in, in uh, Matthews, so it sounds like a good use. Yeah. Um, so on this first sheet, if we can go to the table of permitted uses, um, this is what the applicant presented and this is, does not show what staff also recommended. Um, so telephone exchange down under offices and services, we staff has suggested to cross that off. Um, okay, that is there, all right, it's just not highlighted in yellow. Um, so I believe this is all current then um, with what between staff and what the applicant has suggested be removed from the table permitted uses under BH for that property. Are there any questions? And Mr. Danny Zizos is here. He is the caterer um, and he is not the property owner, but he is the um, part applicant on this property. Mary Jo, um, I see, I correct me if I'm wrong, funeral home is a permitted use. I, that is still on there, yes. Um, we I, can... I, I would just, I'll pull a ball, Paul Bailey here and ask that that be stricken. I'm not sure, sure a funeral home and a retail center would be an appropriate use. Mr. Zizo, so are you comfortable with removing that? Sure, sure. And also, uh, Mr. Dave Taylor, the landlord should be on uh, online as well. So uh, I'm sure we won't be no problem. <laughs> if there's any other questions, please speak up because uh, at least in presentation mode, I'm not seeing everybody. So. What's the difference in a brew pub and a microbrewery? 
It's the size of the building and the capacity that they can um, produce. Okay, and and then um, I think it struck off sales of alcohol, but then brew pub is allowed. So is there a conflict there or? Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. Yeah, this is Dave Taylor. We uh, represent the property owner, which is Christ Life Church. We still are holding meetings there in that facility. Uh, we would not be using it as a funeral home, but we would be conducting funeral or memorial services there uh, on occasion, just for, just for comment. It would not be a mortuary, in other words. I think that's uh, Commissioner Urban's uh, intent, I, I presume. Is that correct, John? That is correct. Uh, yeah, we would want a mortuary there, but be, be fine to have a, some sort of service or something. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, getting back to Ms. Garner, um, yes, um, there is a conflict there. So if you would like to possibly have the brew pub um, stricken because they both go under the prescribed conditions for the same 506.45 of our UDO. Um, I guess one question, if it's a caterer and then in the design there's a bar, if it's an alcohol bar, I understand that that would be the caterer's license. Correct. Um, I don't want there to be a, you know, a conflict between all three of those, I guess, is, uh, is what a... Yes. Would a, a caterer's license preclude the alcohol sales? It's... I, I, can, I cannot specifically answer that because that's under ABC regulations. Um, so the, and I'm not sure, Mr. Zizos, if you, um, what your understanding is for a caterer, but, um, a brew pub is specifically the making of the alcohol, holic beverage and sale on site. Right. I understand, I guess that, um, and since there are restaurants close by, I don't see a reason to strike off brew pub from it. Um, the idea of alcohol sales, though, I wanted to clarify that because if it's, you know, for, for a, a catering, and it's, you know, with wedding celebrations, there may be wine sales. I'm not sure, but um, I just wanted to clarify that before we do anything. We I, also, I want to comment on that. Uh, I'm only going to be doing what the audience uh, allowed me to do. But as far as, you know, having a, a bar and serving uh, liquor before or after, that's not going to happen. This is just going to be a family banquet facility. Um, Ms. Garner, we can clarify that for um, the planning board um, on the 28th and also to and have that also updated for you with the decision date. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hey, are there any other questions? John, I have one. Yes, Commissioner Miller. Um, he should be able to cater beer and wine with with any meals, uh, correct? I saw a bar diagram on the right side of the uh, interior layout. Is there some type of an objection to that? Renee, you don't have an objection to that? I don't have an objection to alcohol sales. I just thought it needed to be clarified before any any um, movement further with the application. Okay, all right. Because it's common to have beer and wine with a catering event. Um, and I, I want to be clear about that. Um, so if, if that's fine and acceptable to everyone, then I'm I'm good. Also, Mr. Miller, the uh, 
uh, the uh, it's in the ordinance and uh, the definition of the banquet hall in there as well. <clears throat> Got it. Okay. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. We appreciate it, gentlemen, for uh, being in attendance tonight. This will come before the planning board on July 28th, and we will uh, come back to us on our next meeting on August 10th. Uh, not our next Maybe. meeting, our first meeting in August. Hey. Is the planning board in attendance tonight? Yeah, many of them. Yes. So then they would have an opportunity. This is a joint public hearing with the planning board. They would have an opportunity to answer questions or ask questions. Okay. Are there any questions from the planning board? Hi, uh, this is Mike Foster. No questions here. Thank you, Mike. And I see Natasha. Yeah, this is Natasha. I do not have any at this time. Okay. It's Jim right, Johnson. I don't need. Okay. I guess we'll um, again. Uh, we'll re. This will come back before our board on August tenth. So we'll we uh, to. Sorry, Mayor. We typically open up for the general public for comment. And Charlie, I believe there's a twenty-four hour period for comments after this hearing. Correct. Okay. Written comment may be received up 24 hours after tonight's meeting. Okay, so if there's anybody from the public that would like to present a comment, you have uh, up to 24 hours from now to present such a comment regarding the Sony application. All right, let's move on to item 9C. Uh, zoning application 2027-12, Family Investments LLC, to change the zoning from O, office to RBS on that certain property located on North Fremont Street across from 313 and 317 North Fremont Street and being designated as tax parcel 19327121. This was also continued from June 8th, Mr. Will. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the board. Um, yes, as you mentioned, this is application 2027-12. This is the pre-public hearing staff analysis. Um, the location is on North Fremont Street. Um, the property does not have an address, so we just refer to it as opposite 313 and 317 North Fremont. It's owned by Morris Family Investments, and they're, they propose to change the zoning from the, uh, of the property from office to RVS for the purpose of constructing three fam single family homes. The next slide shows um, an aerial photograph. As you can see, the existing parcel is outlined in green and it is currently vacant. Um, uh, the next slide shows that, again, the property is currently under, uh, undeveloped. It's um, 0.343 acres in size. There are two large maturing trees on the site which will remain. Those are towards the rear of the site. Uh, in addition to being zoned O, it is also located within the downtown overlay um, district. This is uh, just a, a site plan of the proposed um, subdividing and construction of three single family homes. Um, as you can also see, the sidewalk will be extended along North Fremont um, in front of the three future um, properties. Uh, the next slide is a summary of some proposed conditions. Um, these are fairly standard. Uh, the regulations established under the ordinance of the RVS zoning shall govern the use and development of the site. Uh, it's only to be used for a residential community containing a maximum of three single family detached dwelling units and any accessory uses. It shall comply with the dimensional standards of the RVS zoning district set out in the UDO and site data table on the rezoning plan. And the street, street, streetscape along the site's frontage extended along North Fremont Street shall meet the requirements of the ordinance. Maximum height of one of the single family dwellings is 35 feet. And um, the next two conditions have to do with architectural elevations, which are on the next slide. Um, attached are these um, 
conceptual schematic images of the front elevations of the, of the single family detached dwellings to be constructed at the site. Uh, the applicant may subs subsequently propose additional conceptual schematic images of the front elevations of the, of the dwelling units and such additional conceptual images must be approved by the Matthews Board of Commissioners. The next slide shows that we have um, consistency with the land use plan. Uh, the town encourages a variety of alternative residential housing and mixed use developments in the downtown area. Uh, such uses support the economy of downtown and create demand for a wider array of land uses. And new construction that adds diversity of land uses is essential to the vitality of the downtown. The proposed change in zoning from O to RVS is consistent with these elements of the land use plan. And the final slide is um, staff comments and any outstanding issues. And as you can see, um, planning, police, fire, public works, parks and rec had no concerns uh, about this proposed rezoning uh, on North Fremont Street. Okay, uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, I have a couple questions. Uh, one of the residents that lives in the across the street essentially from this proposal is concerned about water runoff, which is already a problem. Is that uh, gonna be addressed by the developer in some way? I understand there's a pretty sharp uh, topo difference from where these lots will be and, and the lots across the street. There's already a considerable concern about uh, runoff during heavy rain events. Yes, and um, if I recall correctly, that was something that was brought up at their community meeting. And um, the developer has engaged a civil engineer to um, assist with the design of stormwater and we will also be coordinating with the town engineer. And the other concern brought up was uh, some screening at the, at the southern portion of the property uh, with regards to the Lingle's office building. Not sure where that is on here. Uh, um, looks like towards the, oh, okay. Um, yeah, since we'll be going from a residential to, or to a residential zoning district, um, I believe that screening will be required since it's since the surrounding zoning districts, with the exception of the other RVS that's next to this, um, will will require some screening if they have. The the uh, resident's comment said the applicant's plan say that tree preservation may occur in areas generally depicted on the rezoning map. And that's uh, some, some pretty weak uh, wording we'd like to see, I'd like to see uh, improved a little when this comes back to us. Uh, do any of the other uh, elected officials have any comments or questions? I'll, I'll uh, go ahead and speak up. Uh, it's just an FYI or a note of concern. It's not a note of concern for myself, but in light of the Main Street homes, um, these houses will be full-fledged two-story and is by the example elevations, you know, they're going to look three stories in nature because of the roof line. So I just want to raise this to, up to everybody so they're not built and everybody goes, oh my God, they're too big, they're crowding, they're overscale, blah, blah, blah. Um, I would just ask the developer to keep that in mind, you know, unless petitioners don't have a, a problem with it, but these are two full stories with gable and roofs. <laughs> Um, everything across the street is a story and a half, so it's a difference in scale. My opinion, though, is because they are across the street, um, it is not as detrimental uh, as they are when they're side by side. So I just want to lift that up so we don't have that aha moment um, nine months from now. We have uh, any other questions or comments from the commissioners? I have a question. Um, it says, ex, you know, to the RVS expands the alternative style housing. Uh, how does this expand alternative style housing in the downtown area? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I believe that, uh, let me check my notes. 
I think the whole street is RVS due to the smaller lot sizes. Um, it was an infill project a few years back. So they wanted to be consistent with the rest of the street. Uh, most of it, I believe, is due to the smaller side lot lines. Yeah. I'm guessing, Rob, you tell me. Yeah, no, I think that's what, I think that is what the uh, um, diversity of um, residential okay. uses and um, it's uh, also because it is a different land use than some of the other properties that are surrounding the area in the downtown. Okay, any other questions from commissioners? Comments? Okay, hearing none, does the planning board, anybody in the planning board have any questions or comments? Not at this time. Hi, uh, this is Mike. Just a couple questions about size. What is the approximate square footage of those homes? Um, at this time, I I do not know um, because the those were just example elevations. Those so I I think in the community meeting notes they um, are well no I think they just gave a price point in those so I don't know the square footage. Yeah. What's the distance to the lot lines? Uh, I'm sure it's been checked and meets the minimum, but that's a, that's yeah. a lot of house or houses on a very small piece of property. It is. Um, yes, the the side to the side lot lines is uh, six feet, which is um, the minimum. Well, the minimum for the RVS zoning district. So okay. six feet on each side? Six feet on each side. So 33 foot wide lot, it leaves you 21 foot print for a house, 21 foot wide. Okay. Anyone else from the planning board have a question for Rob? I understand the applicants are here. Would the applicants like to say anything? Dick, are you unmuted? Dick Morris? It's Paul Jameson here. Hey, guys. Dick, are you unmuted? You need to unmute yourself. Uh, okay. Am I, am I unmuted now? You are. We can oh, hear you. Do you want to go ahead, Dick? Uh, yeah, we, uh, in order to make this work from, from the dollar standpoint, we needed to get three houses on this lot, which... Uh, of course, is, it does minimize the spacing uh, at the sides of between the houses. And uh, I think when we were meeting with uh, the planning board, we were talking about five foot setbacks and that's what we've got between the houses here. Five foot with each house, so it's 10 feet between the houses. And square footage uh, was somewhere between 22 and 2400. Right. Yes, 2,400 2, is, is my target. Do you have a copy of the project that we completed in Waxhaw um, uh, to put up, Jay or uh, Lori? I had submitted that with the application. Uh, yeah, I've got the images that Rob just shared. Um, let me see if I can find those. Give me just a moment. Paul, while we're waiting on that, the, the price point was mentioned. What is what is the price point going to be on these homes? Um, four twenty five to four fifty. Okay. It's a little hard with those pictures, John. I think to your point, to get a true proportion. Um, I think they came out to be about twenty five feet wide. Is that right, Dick? Twenty four to twenty six feet, something like that. I think so, yes. I think uh, two of them are laid out of 26 and one of them is laid out of 28. Uh, we haven't really gotten into details on, on the, the floor plans or designs until we get by this zoning process, obviously. Right. The pictures that you're going to see when they come up, the houses were approximately 24 feet wide, 1,839 square feet <laughs> each um, with that same five foot setback. 
Paul, I do not have those on the website. Did you have a presentation you wanted to give? Because I, I apologize, I, had, I can't find those on the web. I had submitted that all with you with those pictures, and I don't know at this point. I guess I can go back to an email and see if I can find it. Hang on. Uh, for the rest of the board, uh, we did build six houses in, in uh, downtown Waxhaw, about two blocks off the of Main Street. And uh, as Paul said, they were a little over 1,800 square feet. Uh, the setbacks there were also five feet between the houses, and uh, it turned out quite nice. I think everybody out there is happy with it. Had any of the um, have any of the commissioners gone to see that project? I know that all the neighbors had gone to see it and were very pleased. Had, uh, Jeff, did you drive out, Jeff Miller? No, I did not uh, see the project in Wax, uh, other than the photographs. Um, of the homes themselves and they were they were nice. I do have one question while I'm on. Uh, I heard six foot side yards and I heard five foot setbacks. Um, which is it? Uh, if we're talking about the side in between houses, is it five and five or six and six? I'd like a little clarification, please. It, the way it's drawn, it's five and five. Thank which you. Is what, what we used in Waxall. Okay. Okay, Paul, I've got it. Just bear with me here. Can you all see that? Yes. Yeah, okay. It's a little squashed, obviously, strength stretched, but they're 25 feet wide, 1,839 square feet, three bedroom, two and a half bath. <clears throat> And Paul, all of them have front porches. Yes, sir. Okay. Are, are the three that you're going to build over there front porches as well? Yeah, I would assume that there'll be some uh, front porch. Of course, we've got a, a front entrance garage, which is going to take up some of the, uh, the, the front of the house. But I'm assuming that we, we would have some at least partial front porch, whether or not it'll go clear across the rest of the, the house. Uh, we just haven't gotten that far yet. Yeah, Commissioner Whitley, the, the project in Waxall had a rear common drive. So the I got you. Actually, in I the got rear, we felt <laughs> it was beneficial for this to have a, a garage. And the best way to do that was to put a front load garage. I, I think that puts a real premium on and, and look wise keeps and minimizes the cars on the street. So Paul, are those, uh, garage? I'm sorry, is, is that a tandem garage, Paul? It's single car. No, single car, but is a tandem and you pull two cars in back to back? No, single car. Yeah, one John, car. you asked my question. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, it's one car. Mayor, I have a question. Another question, please. Sure. Commissioner Miller, go ahead. Um, Paul, I noticed that the footprint of the build of the house was towards the front of the lot line, and the back of the lot was substantially large. In other words, the, uh, the backyard, which is to the bottom of one, two, and three, I'm assuming, um, seems large. Couldn't, couldn't that couldn't those houses, couldn't number one and two be staggered back slightly if three's got a tight corner and and uh, balance them out a little bit more and maybe offer up a front porch if that's a desire? You know, it, it one of the things we learned in Waxhaw was that um, is to, to, to build it to a certain specification before you sell it because once they start to make changes to it, pretty soon you're building a custom home and a non-custom home price point. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the premiums that we've found as a result of not just the COVID, but of the market is two things. Number one, every home needs some sort of space for an office. I think that's the future of the real estate market. I think you gotta have a home office, I think to exist going forward. The second is outdoor living space. And I think, Jeff, our thought process is, is that, that outdoor living space 
is now just as much of a premium as indoor living space. So the reason the yards, Dick and I felt um, we wanted to make sure that they were as generous as they could be was because I think people have a real desire to have some type of outdoor entertainment space that is somewhat private. If they want to put a privacy fence in between or any kind of screening in between, the front really doesn't offer that. And if you look at the neighborhood, no one's really hanging out on any kind of a front porch at all. All the other houses consistently don't have front type porches. They're small and more decorative. So we wanted to make sure there was benefit in the backyard. Does that make sense? Sure. I mean, many people prefer a rear deck or a patio and um, some type of an enclosure. So I understand totally. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other? I'm assuming, Paul, that we're going to get a list of uh, materials that you're going to be proposing for the exteriors. Yes. I have a question too. Um, recently, we looked at that College Street and, and talked about putting in if if there needed to be curb and gutter added to it. Um, is that a requisite for this street as well? Or was that something that, or stormwater drainage? Or is that something that has already been decided isn't necessary for this property? Oh, well, I think uh, we're having, there, there would be curb and gutter. I think that's something that, that Jay indicated that either he would like or was necessary. So we're planning curb and gutter. Yeah, I can add on to that, Dick. Um, Commissioner Garner, uh, I just wanted to reiterate in our staff report, there was an error in the staff report and that we did not reflect the comments from the town engineer. Um, Susan does have concerns about stormwater runoff. We have relayed that to the applicant. Um, their site designer uh, should be working on a solution at this time. So that, that does kind of echo the comments from Mr. Sumner across the street. So that is, that's an item that definitely needs to be addressed before this project can come up for decision next month. Daniel Esteban with Stantec is on if you have any specific okay. questions for him. If, Thank you, Paul. Uh, if you want to bring him in. Was there a conversation about sidewalk as well? There will be sidewalk. There will be sidewalk, yes. All right. That's really important to me. Thank you. It'll be one foot wide, John. <laughs> <laughs> Sidewalk's a sidewalk. I didn't take anything yet. <laughs> our, our big our big decision is how to tie it in with the one to the north there because it dead ends into a telephone pole. Do we have any uh, questions okay. from Mr. Morris or Mr. Jamison from the board or the planning board? Uh, just one more question. It could be for Mr. Morris or Mr. Jamison. When you come to the planning board with this on the 28th, are we still going to be conceptual or are we going to actually see pictures of the homes with more specifics about what you really want to do on those lots? Well, uh, Paul can react to that, but I think that we were not going to get into the specifics of what we were going to build beyond saying that there would be similar in appearance to the Waxall houses and the one, the three that we presented uh, with the application. Uh, we haven't gone further into more detail about what we're going to build until we got by the zoning process here. All right. Any uh, other? I comments? would say that, that you know Daniel Esteban is here from the engineering group, and, and they do have a. Uh, proposed solution to the uh, the stormwater and the drainage problem, if you'd like to hear a little more detail on what he has in mind. Sure. Mr. Esteban, would you like to tell us what you have in mind for drainage on the site? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, so uh, uh, everyone's familiar with the site. So there's a ditch that runs um, on the southern side of Fremont right away. Uh, what we're proposing to do is actually go a little bit further uh, west or left of the plan sheet and uh, regrade a portion of that ditch. There is a there's a low spot in what's really causing some of that um, drainage here is there's some low there's a low spot right at the curb and gutter and it doesn't uh, at the end of the existing curb and gutter so it doesn't allow 
that water to, to run down the curb and gutter and further down Fremont, there's two existing catch basins. So the, the proposal is to is to regrade that ditch and then put dual pipes in it. And it's since we don't have a lot of cover there and it's really flat, we're proposing to put two uh, eight inch pipes underneath the sidewalk and the driveways and uh, and capture the runoff that comes from the driveways into the into that piping in the ditch system. So uh, the intent is to have to not let that water sheet across the uh, the Fremont Road and into the or onto the adjacent properties there to the north. There's also some dis there was some mention and discussion about you know the larger areas in the back great outdoor uh, living space it's also an area too that we can do some some water quality and some infiltration so hopefully the reduction hopefully we'll be reducing uh, some of that water that's rushing off uh, and over the streets um, while can so we can contain that on the southern side of the of the homes Mr. Esteban, these plans will be included in your in your application. Uh, they they will, yes, sir. And um, Mayor, just to clarify, um, earlier it was brought up by one of the neighbors, and we met with all the neighbors about, and they asked about the the tree that lined the commercial building. Um, on the one side, there's a line of trees. If you note at the note from our site plan. Those trees will be taken down. The two large trees will remain. It is um, um, very unattractive and really, I don't know that they're really called trees. I think they're just overgrown somethings. But those will be coming down and whatever required zoning or, or whatever required screening will be there, will be, will be put there in its place. All right, do we have any other uh, questions or comments for Mr. Jamison, Mr. Esteban, or Mr. Morris, or Rob or Jay? All right, hearing none, this will go back to the planning board on the 28th, then back to us on August 10th. And again, I'll remind the public that they have 24 hours also to make comments on this application. Let's move on to item 9D. Zoning application 2020-713 Home Depot to change the conditions in that certain B1 SCD shopping center district commonly known as the Home Depot and located at 1827 Matthews Township Parkway and further designated as tax parcel 19323133. This was also continued from June 8th. Uh, Ms. Kalnitz. Uh, thank you again, Mayor. Um, yes, at this time, Home Depot um, has request for uh, continuance again to August. Um, the applicant um, has, since the June 8th meeting, has um, engaged an attorney and the attorney's um, office would like to get up to speed and um, be better prepared for the public hearing um, at the um, August 10th meeting, um, if that is uh, fine with the board. Okay, I will entertain a motion if it's your desire to continue this another month. Mr. Mayor, I'll go ahead and make a motion that we extend the 2027-13 uh, Home Depot uh, hearing until August 10th, 2020. Second. A motion for Commissioner Urban, do we have a second? Second. Charlie's trying to say something, but he's on mute. Charlie, you're on mute. Technically, it's continue it until that day. Continue, continue the public hearing. Yes. Okay, we have a motion to continue the public hearing until August 10th. Second by Commissioner Miller. We'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Bland? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Yes. Commissioner Urban? Yes. Commissioner McCool? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. And Commissioner Whitley, where did you go? Yes. There you are. <laughs> These Zoom calls of participants keep moving around. I think that's everyone. I'll, I will vote in the affirmative as well. So this uh, uh, application 2020-713 Home Depot will be continued until 
our August 10th meeting. Let's move on to item 9E, zoning application 2020-714. Elizabeth Lane Elementary to change the conditions to that existing RICD district on that certain property commonly known as Elizabeth Lane Elementary School to extend the sunset provision from August 1st, 2020, to August 1st, 2022, for nine mobile units to remain on the campus. Aaron Holman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just to reiterate, this is application 2027-14 for Elizabeth Lane Elementary. Uh, Jay, if you go to the next slide. Uh, the zoning, the current zoning is RI conditional district. Um, and I believe they're requesting uh, for eight mobile classrooms to be or to remain located on site from a district or expansion of a district that or area of the site plan that was created in 1995. Uh, Jay, next site or slide. Okay. So this zoning district was originally created in 1995. Um, at that time, there was an area set aside for mobile classroom units. Um, in 2001, CMS requested that that area be expanded to allow for additional units. At that time, the Board of Commissioners also included a sunset provision of one year, stating that it would revert back to the original 1995 line. Um, and then in 2016, CMS requested that, that that sunset provision be extended. And then that was extended, or uh, that provision was extended in 2016, 2017, 18, and 19. Uh, in 2018, CMS did con or complete a queuing study as well at that property. Uh, Jay, next slide. So this is a zoomed in area of the mobile units. Uh, the highlighted area is the original 1995 boundary. Um, as you can see, there are classrooms currently outside of that. And I believe there's a mobile restroom that's kind of teetering on the edge of that line as well. Um, this would allow the, that outside boundary to be extended until 2022. Uh, next slide. And then this is just a zoomed out of that property. Next slide. I also have an aerial of the property. Um, this would mainly affect the mobile classrooms on the out or uh, the back side. Next slide. Uh, so this would continue. Um, some conditions that were already established for the property, like uh, a 100 foot undisturbed buffer area. Um, and then they are requesting a two year extension this year until the end, or August 1st, 2020. Uh, we did receive a comment from Public Works about this property. Um, there was cons our, uh, Public Works that would like to see a commitment that the queuing or the uh, see that the lane stacking that was implementing last year be continued for student pickup. Um, CMS is requesting a two year extension on this request because they're currently undergoing redistricting uh, countywide. And so requesting the two year would help it line up to see what the need or uh, what student enrollment might be in the next few years. Uh, are there any questions? And then I believe the applicants are here as well. I, I have a question. I noticed you said eight talking, but it actually showed nine mobile homes. Is it nine mobile homes? Uh, Jay, can you pull the present or the uh, site plan back up real quick? Yeah, I noticed that at the end. So. Go at the one, the last, near the last one is where it showed nine in your conditions. Right. Uh, so I'm only seeing eight outside. Um, Go to the next slide down near the end is where it was. Right. Under the, uh, it was the very last slide. It was uh, that top condition. It said nine. Right there. Um, yeah. I only counted eight currently outside of the boundary. Uh, I may have been counting that mobile restroom as well too. 
Okay, thank you. Would the uh, representatives from CMS like to say anything? Hello, this is Bob Sorrell. I'm the real estate specialist with CMS. I'm relatively new to CMS, um, but it's my understanding that um, this uh, essential problem will be relieved with uh, the construction of the Lansdowne Elementary, reconstruction of Lansdowne Elementary School uh, to relieve the pressure on um, three other schools, including this one. And that construction was delayed by a year uh, because of some topography issues. So it should open uh, approximately at the time when this, uh, this sunset would expire. And then we would, wouldn't have nearly the need for uh, mobile classrooms. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sorrell. I uh, would just like to say that I discussed this at length with uh, CMS Chairperson Elise Stashu, and she has assured me that uh, you know, within two years, just as Mr. Sorrell said, we expect that uh, Lansdowne will be completed and we'll be able to you know, re relieve some of the pressure at Elizabeth Lane. This has been an ongoing struggle, especially for those of us that have been in elected office for a while. Uh, we've been wanting these these trailers uh, number diminished or have them removed altogether for many years. Um, but I do support this uh, request in that I, I believe we are going to see some relief in, within two years and it's reasonable uh, because of the delay to allow the two years. Um, just remind the board that uh, if we draw a line in the sand, it's likely that children that live in Matthews that attend Elizabeth Lane may be assigned to another school. So, it's, you know, not a really good choice either way, but in my mind, uh, the trailers are better than that option. Commissioner Urban. Um, I, I can support this under a caveat. One is the lane stacking continues, sure. but I'd also like two people to look at this. One is um, I want to make sure that Chief Pennington is still reviewing or still looking at the property in terms of safety issues for the children. And two, we did this several years ago. I think it was at the quest of uh, Commissioner Query that the handrails, the walkways, um, the, the general condition of the buildings and all are inspected and checked. Um, because if I'm not mistaken, um, after that inspection, CMS plowed in, actually I thought it was several hundred thousand dollars to make repairs um, in order to improve safety and mobility and access to these trailers as well. So I don't wanna go two years and find out things have been in terrible disarray, children are getting injured or something's in, in decay. Um, I'd like to have that sort of checked out before we make the final vote. Those are excellent points, Commissioner Urban. Are there any other uh, comments or questions for either Darren or Mr. Sorrell from the town board? Commissioner Bland. Maybe, I mean, like I said, I wasn't on the board back when this was discussed before about this particular school, but why don't, has there been any talk about enlarging this school? It looks like there's a lot of vacant land around this piece of property. Why can't we just enlarge the, the school as opposed to, has there been any discussion of that? Yeah, it's. I think money comes up. No money, yeah. Funding mm -hmm. has been an issue. And, and, and uh, what are the, <laughs> one of the, uh, Commissioner Bland, one of their comments was also, we talked about how it's sort of a fingered type school. Commissioner Urban suggested walling it in mm -hmm. and they said that it would overwhelm their cafeteria and auditor auditorium capacity. And we couldn't quite understand that if the people in the trailers or learning cottages as are referred to um, are already eating there um, but there's a technicality in in the in the legal system and or policy on how they handle that mm. I was just just curious you know it seems like that's been a, a problem for a long time and 
seems to me that there's a an obvious solution, you know, but you know, maybe they're wanting to build back in closer to down to, to the Charlotte side, but I mean, they're going to make a huge, maybe build a school down there, down the road, or, I mean, maybe this is something, you know, you guys talk about, we want to have a good relationship with them, but maybe we need to talk to them and see if this is not, that might not be a better solution that can be fixed a lot quicker than what they're trying to do at Lansdowne. Uh, we, I, th I think it's going to take a uh, multi-pronged attack and we really need to be lobbying the county commissioners who hold the checkbook. A CMS mm -hmm. really doesn't have the money the county does. So you got to get them to release the funds. But I look, I, I share uh, my distaste for trailers as much as anyone. I went to South Mac High School and took classes in trailers and, and seen trailers become a legacy that have lasted 40 and 50 years. So we do want to see them eliminated at some point. Um, but I think um, the other point is it's not only Matthews that has trailers, almost every school in the county has trailers. There's very few that don't. Um, but it's certainly our, our, our wish to ultimately get rid of them and build brick and mortar classrooms like we're used to and not have kids in learning cottages, which <laughs> is a kind of a funny mechanism for that. Are there any other questions or comments? Yes. <laughs> I'm a little late joining you all. I am so sorry. I'm Tricia Stewart. I'm the assistant principal at Elizabeth Lane. And my daughter had a baby three weeks early a little bit ago. So <laughs> I was scrambling to get here. Um, but I just wanted to take a minute and address any questions you have about Elizabeth Lane. I think I might have come in on that conversation. Well, I know that uh, Commissioner Urban mentioned a commitment that you would have to do the double stacking that, that was started to, to alleviate some of the traffic over uh -huh. there. I, I hope we hope that you continue to do that. Uh -huh. and, uh, yes. I don't want to put words in Commissioner Urban's mouth. You want to talk about the safety issues, John? Well, I mean, it was, it was two prong. I mean, I know uh, Chief Pennington was out there and looked at the situation. There were some, uh, we had said we would provide the cameras and pay for it. And that kind of went by the wayside and CMS said we'd do something else. And we know how the security camera issue went with CMS uh, in that scenario. So I wanna make sure that our chief of police feels that our children are being uh, well secured and protected at that campus. In the same light as we did several years ago, I wanna make sure that the walkways and the handrails and, and all the structures out there are in sound condition and are not in any decay or deterioration. Um, you know, Like I said, several years ago, we, we brought that to the attention of CMS. Um, they found some funding to go ahead and make those repairs because I don't want to see any injuries out there uh, because of split rails or someone falling off of something or decks and dis disrepair. Yeah, I can speak to both of those things. So um, each, each learning cottage now has the wide peephole, if you will, on the door so that when the teacher looks out, you have a wider swath of what you can see. Um, the cameras are in place for out there. They are working well. We can monitor those from inside the building. We are committing to, oh, I'm sorry, let me back up. Um, CMS came in last summer and they updated all of the wood that was in disrepair. Um, they put down rocks, it, rocks where the gravel had kind of washed away from the rain. So that's all been repaired. They had an additional exit from the learning cottages onto the track and playground area to alleviate the funnel effect during the event of a fire or a fire drill which makes exiting the learning cottages much quicker than before. Um, and additionally, we had some of our learning cottages enter the building through a different door at the end of the fifth grade hallway, which also made the flow of children much more um, efficient and conducive to moving quickly. Um, from a traffic standpoint, we don't plan on changing anything with traffic this year. Um, once we got into the routine last year with the double stacking, um, we found that it worked great. We got a lot of consistent compliments from people in the neighborhood about how much better it was for traffic out on Elizabeth Lane and 51. So we want to make sure we're keeping our neighbors happy and the bus drivers were able to work with it and we just flipped the way the buses pull into the slots and that allowed them room to swing when they came in and there were really no issues after that. Um, I will share with you that I'm not sure what the council's plan is for providing 
extra duty for officers to come and sign up to help with morning and evening traffic. That was um, really instrumental in helping everything work well. But I can tell you that um, under the proposed plan B of returning to school, it is gonna take every person we have to do temperature screenings and keep kids six feet apart and all of the other requirements we're going to have to follow. So this year more than ever, I would think that it would be crucial that we have some officer assistance out there to help, to help direct the traffic. I want to allow Chief Pennington to address that, but I also want to acknowledge him for being uh, very active in providing a solution for helping mm -hmm. with the double stacking and making that a much safer experience. He did a did a great job, him and his staff. But uh, Chief, would you like to uh, address the extra help? Well, the, the only thing I will address in that is that we're going to need the uh, commitment from the school board and CMS. Uh, that is funded through CMS, so that is not uh, something that we can commit to in our current budget status to say we are going to uh, commit the extra money if CMS is not in this as a partner. So uh, I hear you. We're in it. We're, we will provide that as we can uh, with that off duty or that extra money that CMS pays us. That's how we fund it. So as long as CMS commits to the same partnership we'll commit to, we're in it. Okay. Thank you. I've got a question for either Chief or Ms. Stewart. Uh, could some of those roles be handled by volunteers? Is that allowed under, is that legal? So there, there is a state law that allows us to, um, if you will, commission a civilian uh, traffic control officer, a TCO, and that's under the, the code. So we can do that. The, the, the issue with it is, is um, we have to provide a certain level of training. We've got to provide um, safety equipment. We've got to provide, you know, pay, if you will, um, because it is a traffic control officer that falls under the auspice of the police department. So there are some, some insurance issues there. Now I will admit uh, some of my shortcomings in this last year, Hazen has been really pushing me to kind of come up with a process under this TCO concept. Uh, we just have not been able to, to settle on where it ends. But uh, again, the, the way that it's currently operating is under money from CMS. And that's how we're paying those off duty officers out there to direct traffic. And, and I would agree with Ms. Stewart, it's a, it's a huge help to not only the, the children and the parents, but to the residents out there. It's not a perfect solution the way we've got this thing double stacked, but it's really based on the, the situation, the best we can come up with right now. And, and beyond uh, traffic control, I was, I was thinking of things like temperature checks. Could a, could a stay at home parent that has a few hours, could they volunteer to do that? You mean as far as screening the teachers and um, students? Sure. From what I understand, um, volunteers on campus are going to be pretty limited this year. It'll be staff who are trained and familiar with the protocols. It's a catch-22, however you look at it. So. Besides that, I was told I can't direct traffic anyhow. Is that true, <laughs> Chief? <laughs> that is true. No, without a certain level of training, I think it's three hours a year, we would have to pro provide safety training equipment. Uh, and there is a, a liability insurance concern that we'd have to work through. Uh, Mayor, I want to add to this real quickly too. Uh, school resource officers, we very important to us in our community. They play a great role with the DARE program. Uh, they are warmly received in our schools. We do want to make sure that that funding continues because that is a big benefit and can supplement some of the things we're talking about here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, any other comments or questions for anyone on this topic? And I, again, the uh, public will have 24 hours also to submit comments. I'm sorry, does have somebody have a question or comment? Okay. All right, well, thank you everyone. Uh, that will come back, uh, that'll go to the planning board July 28th and back to us on the 10th. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to reconvene our regular meeting. So moved. Second. Second by Commissioner McCool. Roll call vote. Commissioner Bland? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Yes. Commissioner Urban? Yes. Commissioner McCool? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Whitley? Yes. And I vote yes. So we now are back in our regular meeting and we'll uh,
undertake agenda item number 11, planning and development business. Uh, Jay, do you want to introduce the planning board that are in attendance? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, we have uh, our recently anointed chair, Mike Foster. So welcome, Mike. Uh, well, he's not new to the board, but now the chair. Uh, Jonathan Clayton, Tom Dorsey, Natasha Edwards, Jim Johnson, and Carrie Lamson. If anyone else is in attendance and I, I missed you, uh, uh, speak up. Thank you. Let me just say we appreciate all the work the planning board does. It's a, probably it requires the most work of any of our advisory boards, and we really appreciate it. Uh, let's move on to 11A, receive a report from the planning board from planning board chair, Mike Foster. Mike? Mute button, Mike. Mute button. Someday I'll learn. <laughs> apparently not. Apparently not tonight. <clears throat> okay, I have the report from the planning board meeting of June twenty third, twenty twenty. Uh, two items were reviewed and have been forwarded to the town board for action. First item is zoning motion twenty twenty dash one, United Development Ordinance text amendment for outdoor illumination. The planning board members voted unanimously to recommend approval for the text amendment for outdoor illumination as it was presented at the public hearing with one foot candle at the property line of non-residential developments. The text was be, to be found consistent with the Matthews land use plan because it updated text language to match current technology requirements. And it provides additional definitions in order to assist developers in understanding the regulations. The text amendment was found to be reasonable because it promoted public safety through best practice standards. Second of my item was an administrative amendment for Creek Bend monument sign. Uh, the administrative amendment for the monument sign at the Creek Bend subdivision was unanimously recommended by the town planning board. Uh, the request was found to be consistent with the Matthews land use plan and the town's long range plan as there was no significant impact to neighboring properties allow for subdivision signage and has a positive impact to the adjoining properties. Uh, as a side comment, the planning board, I believe, unanimously also agreed that the uh, knee wall with the new sign was a much better option for the entrance to the neighborhood than the two pergolas that had been originally presented and approved. And as Jay mentioned, uh, our new members were in place and that's the last meeting and we had our elections with new officers. And that's all I have. Are there any questions from the board? Okay, hearing none, thank you, Mike, appreciate that. We'll move on to uh, planning and zoning related actions, B1, motion 2020-1, text to change the text to revise the standards of outdoor illumination that Mike just spoke of, Mary Jo. Um, yes, um, as Mr. Foster said, um, the planning board recommended unanimously to keep the original text that was presented at the public hearing. Um, and it says um, section 155609.7.A, all new lighting installations and renovations to existing lighting fixtures adjacent to a commercial property shall show the intent to limit foot candle levels at property lines to one foot candle initial illumination. So they reviewed the two foot candles as requested during the public hearing by a commissioner um, and they felt that um, the staff proposed changes should be left as is. Um, so it's up to the board whether they want to go with the recommendation um, by the planning board or um, go to the two foot candles back up to two foot. Okay, thank you Mary Jo. Questions, comments, or motions? I have one question, Mayor. Go ahead, Commissioner Miller. Uh, commentary. Um, call me old, called me old fashioned, but you know, when I was a kid, lighting used to be easy. You, you had a 25, a 40, a 75, and a 100 watt bulb. You could decide how many watts to put in a fixture, and that was an incandescent bulb. Then you have a CFL. And supposedly they're also me measured by wattage. 
And then when you go to outdoor lighting, you have commercial lighting and it needs to be dark sky compliant. It can't light up vertically or that you can't see the stars. And then recently they go to LEDs and LEDs are being measured by lumens. What's up with the foot candles? Uh, how many languages do we need to speak? Mary Jo, do you have a comment? Um, all I can say is that that's how you measure the light is the is during is foot candles and the lumens. That's you know we've went to the technology expert, our engineer, and this is what has been suggested. And our old ordinance measured it as foot candles. Also, we updated it to have lumens be with the current technology. Jeff, the wattage is the amount of power required to run the light and not really yeah. directly related to how much light or brightness that actually comes off of it. But yeah, it does get very confusing. I, I agree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> have any questions, comments, or motions? Well, if everybody's slow on the draw, Mr. Mayor, I'll go ahead and make a motion that we approve 2020-1 that the uh, requested zoning action is most currently amended is approved and has been found to be consistent. It allows for the incorporation of text language to match current technology requirements. Additionally, it provides specific language for staff to enforce the ordinance and assist developers in understanding the regulations. And the text amendment is reasonable because it promotes public safety through best practice standards. Thank you, Commissioner Urban, for that motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Urban, a second by Mayor Pro Tem Garner. We'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Bland. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Commissioner Urban. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Sure. <laughs> Commissioner McCool. Yes. And Commissioner Whitley, who, if you haven't heard me say how sharp you look tonight, let me say it again in that uniform. How do you vote? Thank you, sir. Yes, 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 I do vote. I vote yes as well. So that passes unanimously. Thank you guys. We'll go to the next one. Uh, planning and development business 11B2, administrative amendment for Creek Bend subdivision. Mary Jo. Uh, thank you again. And this is the last time you will hear from me this evening, Mayor. Um, the land, develop, land Investment Resources LLC was the original applicant for Creek Bend subdivision out on Ida Wild Road. Um, in 2014, they approved the town board, excuse me, August 14, 2017, the town board approved the rezoning for um, the subdivision. One of the notes, conditional notes, discussed the entrance monuments and proposed uh, gazebo type uh, entrance monuments on either side uh, along Idlewild Road. The developer is now requesting replacing the gazebo with a two foot knee wall on both sides and one single shingle type monument sign on one side of the entrance. Um, they have uh, land investment resources. The original um, home builder has now gone away and new home builders um, have decided they do not want the gazebo style entrance monuments. Uh, and you have recently within the last year approved new elevations also for this subdivision. Um, so thank you, Jay. Keep scrolling down to the pictures, please. So the, here's the entrance and that shows uh, the approximate area of the two foot knee walls. Um, Sorry for the technical that's, difficulties. That's okay. And the sign on one side. Next slide, please. Again, this is the monument that they're looking at, um, type signage that they would like to install. Next slide, please. And a view of the monument again. Um, this shows what the original rezoning of 2017 showed that they were proposing to put at the front entrance, one of these type gazebo um, seating areas. 
Um, the subdivision is only 20, 20, 29 homes. I uh, can't remember exactly at this time. Um, and out on Idlewild Road, which will be widened eventually, um, the, the new home builder felt that this is not um, a best use for finances to put this type of structure out there. Plus they don't feel that this would be well used. Next slide. Again, here's a photo of what proposed would look like for the monument and signage. Next slide. And this is just the overall development. And there will be um, required um, landscaping along the road, sidewalks that have already been installed um, along Idlewild Road. Um, I believe, um, I can't see all the participants, but I do believe that Mr. Hayes, the original applicant is on the meeting tonight. Um, if there's any other questions, I, again, it is the request to remove the gazebo style entrances to go with the knee wall and the monument signs. Okay, can we, uh, can we go off the presentation view? Thank you. Are there any questions? Commissioner McCool. Um, is there any way we can know what the color of the lettering on the sign will be or what the sign would be? I just want to be sure it's not going to be like lime green or something. <laughs> something well, outlandish. No, and uh, we can't determine color when we approve a sign and that has to be approved. Um, signage all has to go through staff to be approved. Okay. 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 I seriously doubt they're not going to do lime green. Mary Jo, you said the applicant is here. Yes, Mr. Hayes is on. I see he is on the call. Okay, yeah, Mr. Phil Hayes. Sir, can you hear me? Mr. Hayes, can you turn your speaker or your mic on? Got it. Thank you. All right. Good evening. Um, I I tend to agree that uh, you know gazebos along Ottawa Road would probably not get a lot of use, but have you considered? Moving at least one of one of such structures into the neighborhood as an amenity for th those that live there. Sure, I'd like to address that. Um, I want to thank you for uh, letting me uh, come back before you, and, I, and I, I'm sorry that this has to be a loose end that we have to clean up. We have a considerable amount of open space within this subdivision. Unfortunately, most of it is all within the floodplain. We looked at options for trying to move the gazebo or that similar type of structure within the open space areas, but it's, it's not structurally permitted. We will have uh, a large number of walking paths in the back of the lots in the open space, but that one particular item just doesn't have a place where it can reside. What we will have with our community mailbox is a covering over that community mailbox where people can stop, pick up their mail, not get covered um, or not have be exposed to the rain while they're doing that. So that will be a structure that will be placed into an easement area. One of the issues in not having any common open space where we could provide a structure was that it would end up being in somebody's backyard and we just didn't feel like that was a conducive situation. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hayes. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Hayes, there's a there's a note, maybe Mary Jo can answer this. There's a note on the drawing that's highlighted. It says frontage column and fence typical. Um, yet I'm not seeing how that plays into this signage. Is it something that dies into the signage? Is it being deleted or? I mean, there, what's the relationship between the signage and this fence that, that calls out? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not. Where is that note? Go to the very, it's the very bottom. It, it, right below the burn planning, it says frontage column and fence typical. And yeah. the same note is on the north side of the page yeah. as well. So Mary Jo, you want to address that? I sure will, Mr. Hayes. Um, so the original landscape plan that was approved showed fencing within the landscaping. 
Um, it is my understanding that now the developer is removing the fencing and so they will have to come back to staff for approval for a new landscaping plan, which I believe they are in the process of doing. Is that correct, it, Mr. Hayes? Yes, is, is the language in the note um, to recite it basically says the fence was an optional addition to the landscaping plan. Which on the we are, yes, on the rezoning. Are, yes, which we are now going to reconfigure the landscaping, uh, hopefully make it much more creative now that we have a berm out as opposed to uh, the conditions that we originally thought would be there. So the fence does not seem to be something that makes sense with that new landscaping plan. Yeah, let me clarify, Mr. Urban. Um, so the original rezoning, besides the gazebos, it also had a note that said it was up to the developer whether he put a fence in there in front along this uh, Idlewild Road. So they have chosen not to. However, when the civil plans were approved, it showed the fence in the civil plans. So now they have to come back to staff um, to get it reapproved without the fence to make sure they meet the landscaping requirements uh, according to our ordinance. So are we gonna have our arborists vet this and, and look for an, an enhanced landscape buffer or an enhanced it, landscaping? It's in our ordinance, yes. It, it's, it'll be different than what was originally approved. Um, so the schematic and the rezoning was just just pictures. It was just for, you know, for uh, drawing's sake, it did not specifically meet our ordinance requirements. But when the civil plans came through, we did make sure it met our ordinance requirements based on the fence being in there. Once the fence is removed, then there's additional requirements that have to be met. So they have to bring that back to staff. Okay, that, I just wanna make sure because it seems like we were doing deducts and not getting anything for our deduct, um, inclu including the pavilion because uh, a pergola or a pavilion or whatever is definitely a more expensive element than this particular sign, which I'm fine with. Um, I like the pavilion for the fact is that someday there'll be a sidewalk around out of wild and people want to go to the park and they're strolling along and they want to take a rest. They could take a rest there, but being at all as it may, I will look to uh, Mary Jo and staff to keep the iron hot with the landscaping. Thank you. You're welcome. I think I detected a little bit of frustration in Commissioner Herbin's voice and mine as well, because this is the second time uh, this, these plans have changed on something that we voted on initially. Uh, so while I agree, I can, I can go along with it. I'm, I'm a little bit frustrated that the plans keep changing on what we initially approved. Correct. That being said, would anybody like to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Go ahead. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the Creek Bend Subdivision Administrative Amendment request for a change of entrance monuments to a knee wall and monument sign, and that it's consistent as that it supports the economic viability of the Creek Bend Subdivision. And it's reasonable because there is no significant impact to neighboring properties and allows for similar signage showed in subdivisions throughout Matthews. Thank you, sir. Do we have a second? Second. So we have a motion to accept this uh, administrative amendment by Commissioner Miller, seconded by McK Commissioner McCool. We'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Bland. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. No. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Urban. Yes. Commissioner Whitley. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Commissioner McCool. Yes. And I will vote yes as well. So that passes six to one with all in favor, except for Mayor Pro Tem Garner who voted uh, no. Thank you. Thank you, Let's board. Move on to the next item. Uh, discuss code enforcement plan for Eastwood Forest Subdivision, Mr. Carlo McCoy. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Carlo. Good evening. All right, this is my first time being uh, before the board and 
I'm bringing forward to you. You, you heard earlier um, some additional comments coming from Mrs. Owens and uh, Mr. Withrow. And I've come here to sort of bring you guys up to date as what we have done in Eastwood Forest in the past, uh, talk about what we're doing now and talk about some things that we wanna do, you know, um, in the future on that or we, that we would like to do. Um, Eastwood Forest, if and everybody probably knows that, it's probably one of the um, <clears throat> most affordable neighborhoods that we have in Matthews. And with that, you know, there's a, a, a fair amount of issues that we have to deal with. But when you look at what our town code and zoning has to do, it's pretty much take care of the character of the neighborhood, make sure that it, it, we maintain that type of stuff. And you know, when I go out there as a code enforcement officer, I endeavor to do that, but I end up, end up working with all the residents to ensure that all those standards, zoning, town code, et cetera, are kept up in Eastwood Forest. <clears throat> if you look at what I've done in there, we've done extensive enforcement in that neighborhood. We all, we're looking at tall grass, trash and debris, junk vehicles and zoning. And most of the enforcement is, uh, I would say it's mostly driven by complaints, but mostly what I can see visibly from the street. So what we have done, uh, I've used, we've used a significant amount of resources there. The police have been out there every time I, a lot of times when I have to go out there, I have to utilize them. What you will recall is Mrs. Owens and, um, and Mr. Withrow said, um, Mr. Withrow made a comment on the June the 9th, he came back again tonight. And he and I met out there and we, and he's correct. We found a lot of things wrong out there. Trash and debris at the properties, which is a violation of section 9401. Um, junk vehicles in the front and rear of the vehicle. Uh, a lot of that stuff was behind the fence. So let me tell you about Mr. Withrow though. Uh, I appreciate him allowed me because what he allowed us to do is go look on his property before most of the things I see was what I could see from the front door. He allowed us to go look at the rear of some property. So we saw some really um, interesting things when we went back there, a lot of trash and other types of things, um, zoning violations that were back there like sheds there were, some were over the property line, some that were pretty close to the property line, junk vehicles, you know, they there were some of them in the back and even, in the front of the yard, sometimes the fence hide what we could see. What we are looking at, what I decided to do, I document, I didn't just stop at the properties that he um, brought out to. I went throughout the entire Eastwood Forest, documented it, we got photos and other types of stuff. And we're gonna be working with the property owners. That's what we need to do. We're gonna be working with the property owners to bring them into compliance. You know, and if they and if they're violations, if they're not fixed or anything like that. Um, we plan to, you know, for instance, that civil penalties can be issued for, for any type of zoning violations. Um, we're going to always seek um, some type of alternative if we can. I don't think this is going to be something that's going to, we're going to be able to do in 30 days. It's a 60, 90, maybe even longer time frame to be able to do this. They, some of them got junk vehicles that's been there for a while. We're going to be look at removing those and, and coming up with orders. The trash is going to be one of the big problems there because there's trash on a lot of properties in there. So we're going to have to go ahead and do something with that. My so solution with the trash is do something like we did in Crestdale. We had like a cleanup day uh, or something. And we've ha actually had one. I wasn't there about 10 years ago, uh, cleanup day in Eastwood Forest. Have something like that. We provide the dumpsters. Um, if we're going to help them, because again, it's our most affordable neighborhood. We need to, if we can, maybe look at having reduced landfill fees in case they do something that we, we uh, that will help them out. We are not gonna be doing anything if the property owners all um, do what they're supposed to do. If they clean up, we don't have to go in and do anything. But I would think based on what I've done in the past, we're probably gonna have to do some things. And if they don't clean up, we'll come in there with whatever type of equipment and you know that we need to do that with. Okay, one thing I've done though, that I started this process off by talking to all the landlords. There are about four of them that owns about 40% of the property. So I've sort of got their buy-in already, including the uh, speaker that you heard earlier today. So I've gotten his buy-in to do that. Um, and so we're gonna go ahead, start cleaning up. We're gonna have junk, all the junk vehicles, we're gonna have them move. Um, zoning violations were something now. I. 
I, I, when I sent my notice of violation out to the um, property owners, I say, contact me. They started off, and, and, and they did. I've had about three, three calls already saying, hey, what do I need to do? So I'm already start working with, and that is the key, be able to communicate with them. So um, I'm gonna continue to communicate with them. And we have some, what I call zoning issues, like sheds that are too close to the property line. Uh, those, we're gonna have to work with them to bring those into compliance, probably a marriage or something. I talked to one lady that was 74 years old. She said her husband built it 50 years ago. We're gonna try to work with her to bring that into compliance by seeking a, a, a zone and bearing. Now, if they don't clean up, I, I anticipate there's a potential that the town's gonna, and I really, uh, just like Mr. Whitford says, we need to have the board, they need to understand what we can do, we need to have their backing, because if they don't clean up, we're gonna need to go in there and clean up. And typically when we do um, public nuisance cleanup, liens are sort of placed against the property if they don't pay. I mean, they, we, will, we will do it at our, you know, but it'll be at their expense and we'll put a lien against their property. Um, so we don't, not necessarily asking anything right now, but you know, we, it's, this is for discussion purposes only. And can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So, so this is for discussion purposes only. Are there any questions? I have. Carl, I have let me just uh, let me let me start by saying that you've got one of the toughest jobs in the town, and we really appreciate all your efforts here. Um, speaking only for myself, I, I would say that I really appreciate the very measured approach you're taking. You don't just uh, you know, go slam the hammer down and say you have 30 days to clean this stuff up because that's not reasonable. It didn't take 30 days to get there. It's going to take longer to clean it up. That being said, we do need to take some action there. It looks like some cleanup has already been undertaken on some of those uh, homes that I drive by on a regular basis, but uh, I understand more is needed. Um, Commissioner Miller, do you have a comment, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Carlo, are you suggesting then that the, the town or the taxpayers pay for the dumpster fees? Uh, as an example, I just paid $675 for a 30-yard rollout. Um, it, it almost seems like it'd be more than one per property uh, on, on Morningwood. Is this, uh, is this something the town would pay for then? Um, Commissioner Miller, what we're really looking for um, when we call, talk about a dumpster, we want to put one or two dumpsters on, on, a, on a cleanup day. We really do want the, the property owners to clean up themselves so we won't have to do it. And if we have to go in, we probably won't be doing the dumpster. We probably do more of a heavy type of equipment. So you're talking about, let's say if we had to clean everything up, you're probably talking about 25 um, truck, dump truck loads of stuff. That's at one, the stuff that I saw and probably a similar amount of hours there. So that it's going to be a little bit different if we have to do it. Okay. Mr. Mayor, members of the board, I, Carlo, come up with a very good plan in my opinion. And I, and he showed me some pictures and it does kind of blow you away really the amount of junk. I don't know how else to say it. And I, I think, and Carla has a very good reputation of working very well with people, being a very good communicator. But I do think if push comes to shove in order to really get this cleaned up, we may need to expend some town funds. And then what we'll do is we'll put a lien on the property and we have precedent with this. We've done this on property on Honeysuckle Ridge and we've gotten the money back too, thanks to Charlie Buckley. But so I think it's time for action. I think Carlo and Jay have come up with a great plan and we just wanted to give you guys a heads up to say, okay, it may cost some money to, as a last resort, to kind of push this across the finish line. Very good. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see it cleaned up, but I do want to give give those that live there an opportunity to clean it up themselves. And, and then if they don't, then we, Carla laid a hammer down, but uh, we'll <laughs> we would. be somewhat reasonable to let, give him some some time to clean it up. Any other uh, comments or questions for Mr. McCoy? Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. Great job. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll move on to agenda item number 12, the consent agenda. I will- I'd like to make a motion that we approve consent agenda A through E5. Second. Okay, we have a motion 
to accept the consent agenda items 12A through E5 from Mr. Whitley, a second from Commissioner Miller. We'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Bland. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Mr. Urban. Yes. Mr. Whitley. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Mr. McCool. Yes. I vote yes as well. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Move on to unfinished business. Receive an update from NCDOT regarding South Trade Street culvert. Uh, I believe we have Mr. Littlefield PE from NCDOT here with us. Yes, and Brian Davis should be on. He's a resident engineer for U5804B and he'll be providing the update. Okay. Hey, how are y'all doing? Good. We're wanting that bridge done. Yeah, <laughs> I made the game, as do I. Um, so I, I, I appreciate y'all, um, excuse me, I, I appreciate y'all having me on. Uh, I appreciate Hayes and, and, and inviting uh, Jeff and myself on to, uh, to tell you a little bit about what's going on at Trade Street and, uh, and how we move forward. Um, uh, this um, this slide here shows a shot of Trade Street as soon as we um, turned it into the current pattern that we have now. Um, to your right is Brenham Lane, and you're looking back towards uh, downtown. Um, next slide, please. Um, the project overview. Um, this, uh, this project was to provide, uh, just to bring everybody, all the board members up to speed. Um, the, uh, we were to do improvements from uh, just north of Chapin Lane all the way down to just south of, um, of Marquee Place. Um, there was, a, we will widen Trade Street from two to four lanes uh, from, from Chapin to Weddington. And um, and then extending uh, the Four Mile Creek box culvert uh, to both the east and west sides, and uh, and and uh, we are also uh, building uh, headwalls for the future pedestrian culvert um, uh, for a, and a future uh, pedestrian path, and uh, we have we're also um, adding uh, bike lanes and and sidewalks. Um, to complement the uh, the bike lanes that we already have. Uh, next slide, please. Um, project delays. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure everybody wants to know. You know, what in the world's taking so long? Um, uh, towards the beginning of the project, we we did have a a phase change um, in which the contractor uh, did not have enough room or he felt like when he bid on the job that he had enough room uh, to provide the shoring uh, necessary to um, hold up the roadbed while they excavated around the culvert. Um, and um, uh, they tried for several months to, uh, to, to make that work. Um, and in the end, um, uh, they could they could not make that work, so they had to they had to flip to the uh, and start from the other side from the northbound side. Um, however, they they got over to the northbound side and figured out fairly quickly that they would have to uh, they would have to shore that area as well. Um, and uh, is uh, uh, and the uh, the type of shoring needed uh, was quite labor intensive and uh, and took a while. Um, wet weather um, has also kind of plagued the job. Um, if you recall, the, the, the project started in late 2017. Um, and, uh, and most of the work was to be done in, uh, in 2018. Uh, however, uh, 2018 was, um, was, was very wet. Um, and, uh, and even, even after 2018, um, any time that uh, we get say a half an inch of rain or so uh, that that area doesn't flood but it gets up onto the on, onto the floodplain onto the bench 
uh, fairly easily uh, for the amount of rain that's produced. And uh, and once that happens, uh, it, it makes it difficult to work on the culvert, which was the controlling operation for, for most of the project. Um, and then uh, and then uh, the last thing there is uh, utility location and relocation. Um, some utility owners did have uh, trouble uh, locating their facilities um, in order for us to do our work and work around them. Um, that is no longer a, a problem right now. Um, and so, um, uh, before I before I continue, does anybody have any 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 questions about the delays? Okay. Um, next slide, please. Um, there, this is a shot of the culvert construction, I believe, on the uh, on the west side or on the southbound side of Church Street. Um, as you can see, uh, we we extended it uh, uh, pretty far. Um, I believe about uh, 30 feet in both directions. Next slide. Uh, where do we go from here? Um, uh, as as Mayor Higdon mentioned, um, we uh, we want this thing done, and um, and the uh, I think the quickest path to do that, um, the quickest way to um, to Get traffic um, because I know I know a lot of I know that that is a that is a bottleneck uh, during AM and PM rush hour um, is to put Trade Street into its final pattern and uh, these are the these are the items uh, the, the major items of work that we need to get done in order for that to happen uh, we need to complete the 24 inch water line that is going down the southbound side the southbound uh, widening. Uh, we need to complete the storm drain on the southbound side as well as well as the curb and gutter. And we need to uh, we need to finish asphalt paving. Um, this not only includes the widening, but there is some um, there is some wedging that needs to be done uh, in between the Culvert and Weddington Road. Um, and uh, we also need to uh, to put in the sidewalk handrail going across the culvert and and guardrail. Um, and these items will take approximately two to two and a half months. Um, so we're from from now. So we're probably looking at the the somewhere between Labor Day and the middle of September uh, to put traffic in its final pattern. Uh, next slide, please. Um, work to be done uh, after shifting to the final pattern. Um, we have a a 16 inch sewer line that is um, that is probably the controlling operation of the project, or be the longest item. Um, we've had we we have had some delays with this with this sewer line. Um, it is um, it is as we found out in in, in quite a bit of rock. Um, the contractor tried to uh, tunnel this sewer line uh, uh, about six months ago, uh, or I'm sorry, a little longer than that, uh, probably more like nine months ago, uh, they began tunneling. Um, and uh, this is, um, uh, they, uh, they could not drill uh, and, uh, and and they they found out that they were in a lot of rock, and so therefore uh, they had to put a man, physically put a man in inside the encasement pipe, and have him chip with a jackhammer um, the the area around the encasement until they uh, until they uh, uh, got to the other side. Um, he was able to chip out about a foot a day. And it's a 180 foot sewer line, so it 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 took it took about six months. Um, once they were done with that, uh, the contractor uh, was not able to tie in the sewer line uh, because it did not flow. Uh, the new work that was done, um, it, it it was done uh, it was done correctly. Uh, but they did not verify the existing manholes that they were tying into. 
Um, and so we were, we were having to do this sewer line over again. Um, I will say this, that this will be done uh, well off the shoulder and should not affect uh, traffic, um, which is why putting Trade Street into its final pattern is a, is a, it is, is something that we're going to go ahead and do. Um, the, uh, we also have monolithic islands. That's actually a mistake. Um, I would probably want to put that, that item uh, probably back into, um, uh, back where we are uh, putting Trade Street into its final pattern. Uh, because once we make Trade Street four lanes, there's probably going to be, um, well, not going to be, it, it will be dangerous to make a left uh, from Brenham Lane out onto Trade Street heading towards Weddington Road. And so we will probably put that monolithic island in to disallow left-hand turns from Brenham Lane uh, onto um, southbound Trade Street. Um, the, we also have the final lift of asphalt where we will be putting down the final layer of asphalt for the entire project and the final pavement markings and signing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, how will these items affect the traffic? Um, the contractor is allows the contractor to install lane closures from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, however, these item, the items in the roadway, uh, the items that I just mentioned to you, will probably most likely be done at night uh, to ensure uh, better production for the contractor and a better product. And, uh, and, and of course, this will also uh, uh, be better for the traveling public as well. Um, when will we be complete with the project? Uh, we are looking at early spring for 2021 uh, to be completely done. Um, and you you may ask yourself why you know why why is that why is it why do these last items take so long? Um, in, in reality, they, they don't. Um, but when you're coming up on winter, um, some of these items like the final lift of asphalt um, and the final pavement markings, our, our standards and specifications uh, preclude a, a contractor from, from, from doing these activities during the winter months. Um, and so, uh, yet again, another reason why we need to go ahead and put Trade Street into its final pattern um, to alleviate the congestion. Um, the, and, and so the facility, the Trade Street itself will have, uh, will at least have its functionality uh, as intended. Um, and uh, the next slide has, um, my contact information and Jeff's contact information. Um, but uh, at this time, I'll also take questions from anyone who has uh, has any questions. I, I have a question that maybe it's somewhat of a, maybe more of a comment, but I know stuff happens, but, but how does a pipeline that's being dug a foot a day go 180 days of being dug before someone figures out that it's in the wrong location. I just can't imagine that. I mean, what well, kind of the, oversight do we have on this project? Well, the, 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 uh, the, the, the pipe that was installed is in the right location. That, that's, not, that's not the issue at all. Okay. It's, the, it's the manholes that, were, uh, that, that already exist that we're tying into. Um, the elevations that were provided in the plans are incorrect, and uh, it it actually it actually states in our plans uh, that the contractor is to field verify these elevations to make sure that it will flow. Well, he did not do that. They did not do that, and so this is why we're uh, a reason why uh, we're in the situation that we're in, at least with the sewer line. Okay, and the other, I guess, question I have is, uh, we're saying spring of 21. Um, is that, you feel pretty solid about that? Because I've been telling people 
next spring for a couple of years now. Um, years. <laughs> is that is that is that going to happen? I I, I do I, I do feel um, fairly confident in that. Yes, sir. All right, we're going to hold you to it. <laughs> Are there any uh, questions, Commissioner Miller? Thank you. Um, Brian, you and I have exchanged a few emails uh, through the years and we've met on site. Um, the Boyke family, which lives on the corner, uh, the first house on the left on Brenham Lane, are very frustrated in that they've been under construction or their yard has been part of your temporary right away for two and a half years or thereabouts. They want to put a fence up and you said they need sufficient vegetation and you said it looks sufficient, but you have to wait until it's all over with. Um, if the sidewalk is being used and the guardrails are already up and they own up till within six inches of the guardrails, the handrails along the sidewalk, is there a logical reason why they can't put their fence up uh, sometime soon? The only reason, and re really the only reason why I would discourage that is because um, I mean, there, there, there's always a chance that we could have a drought and that, that grass die um, and that slope uh, start to erode and head cut. Um, and in which case I would ask my contractor to go and fix it um, and seed it again. Um, and where they want to put their fence. And, and, I'm, and, and, and I've, I've read um, Mrs. Boyke's um, reply mm -hmm. um, to, to uh, the email chain that you and I have had. Mm -hmm. and, and I think I think probably the best thing is for me and you and, and, and Mrs. Boyke and my supervisor um, to to uh, to meet. I would I, I would be willing to, to do that again and see if there's anything uh, anything that we can do. But I, I guess the, the short answer is is if is if for any reason that we have to get on that slope between now and the and, and the end of the project. My fear is, is that once we put a piece of equipment on that slope and it gets down to the, to the bottom of that slope or the toe of that slope where, where the Boykies want to put their fence, they're, they're, they're going to get, they're going to nick it and, and they're, they're going to damage it. Um, kind of like we damaged the sign. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, and, and so, and I, and I don't want that, I, I don't want that to happen. Uh, especially after the boykies have been waiting this long. So uh, I, I think I think probably the best thing to do is 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 uh, is for me to get my supervisor, and and uh, and we meet with the boykies, and uh, and see if uh, and I, and I'll go ahead and talk with my supervisor to see if there's uh, if there's if there's anything uh, anything that I can do if I'm thinking about this correctly. Um, you know, just to, just to double check behind me. And I guess my other question is, you know, this greenway is supposed to go under Trade Street. It would have been nice if it was coordinated about at the same time. However, when you guys are complete, the drilling or boring of a, a hole or a tunnel under Trade Street is going to happen for the extension of the greenway. And the greenway is in the Boyke's side of the creek. Are they going to get a construction easement with the Korean church or are they going to tunnel through from the other side? Do you have any knowledge of that? I, I, I don't. Uh, I don't, Commissioner Miller. Um, my, I don't either. What, you, you don't either, Jeff? No. We can look into it, though. See what's Miller, out. What, what, I, what I would like because I'm probably going to be the resident engineer on this on that project too. Mm -hmm. What I would like to do is is I would like to be able to access the pedestrian walkway and the sewer easement that runs um, 
that runs along the back side of the Boyke's yard. That's what I would like to do. Um, if you if you if you recall what I'm talking about, there, there's a there's a bollard or a couple of bollards that are up on, on that pedestrian path. I would like to access that pedestrian path and and then from there access the sewer easement to okay. to be able to be able to drill, um, or or either that or 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 better yet, dig from the other side. One is acceptable as long as you don't have to go down their side yard again. Yeah, and and uh, you would uh, you would make any repairs to the greenway due to heavy equipment tearing it up. Correct. I mean, it's only uh, seventy five feet or so before you turn left onto grass. Correct. Yeah. Yes. That that is what we would do. Um, uh, you know, that that would be something that I'm I'm sure we would work out in a municipal agreement. Um, but if I were a contractor, I would, I would access the absurd amount of right away that we have on the southbound side. Okay. And, and, and start digging from there. Well, thank, and the last question, and I'm sorry to take up so many people's time here. Um, uh, what I see on the slope grass planting, sometimes they spray, sometimes they put a net. If it's already been planted, could you not spray over the hand railing versus bringing a netting in? That depends. When we when we uh, when we make the decision to bring in the netting or, or the, the the matting there, uh -huh. um, the matting is used primarily for two reasons. One is if you have a really steep slope that uh, a slope that is it would be questionable whether or not you'd be able to hold grass um that that matting holds the seed in place make sure it gets down into the soil and 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 allows the seed to germinate um and uh and, and so that is um that that's typically why we use that um Would we be able to, for any, if we had to do the whole slope ever again, let, let's say I would, I, I imagine, I, I imagine that we would, uh, especially as we get towards Brenham. Um, well, no, no, I, I, I take that back because it starts to flatten out. As we get towards the culvert, um, towards the back of their yard, I would probably map that again. Um, it, it, if it has to be messed with at all. Okay, thank you. I just I just want to urge us to cooperate and work with each other because that family wants to put up a fence and get some of their privacy back and continue their gardening. I understand. Thank I know uh, Commissioner Urban has a question. I just have a comment to what Commissioner Miller said. You know, you may want to consider. I don't know if this is possible, but putting up a temporary fence or just something for privacy that could be easily taken down again, if need be. Uh, Commissioner Urban, do you have a comment? Yeah, I guess, Hazen, do we have any skin in the game for this particular section of the project? We do not. We, we do have skin in the game for the culvert, culvert though, us in the county. So are, are, there, are there penalties for delays and stuff like that revolving around the culvert? Yes. And, yes, and that, that is correct. To 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 date, um, it is it, it, they've been assessed well over three hundred thousand dollars. And and is that is that prorated to our share involved in the culvert? Commissioner Urban, I misspoke. The culvert is the road project. We're talking about a tunnel, so we're oh, you're talking about the greenway tunnel with the county. Okay. Okay. So we just we just end up with frustration, no money. Okay, thank you. But you know, I think the light of it, and this is news to me, hopefully to everybody. Two and a half, two two and a half months. If it feels like it's completed, that's half the battle. I think all the orange cones and the lane shifting. I, I, I guess what I say to the DOT guys, I hope that you can make it look as completed as possible, and some of these other things are being done. I guess behind the scenes. So that the general public, because you guys probably have heard this before, P 
people fuss to the town. They think the town is in control. We keep telling them it's not us, but if Maureen Keith's on the line, social media, we get bombarded with complaints about this. And, and, and Hazen, you, you guys just uh, feel free to, to, to put them on to my office. Yep. Appreciate it, Brian. Well, Brian and Jeff, we, we appreciate everything NCDOT does for us, but this particular project has become a real burr in everyone's saddle. I get a call or a text or an email or a comment at the grocery store at least two or three times a week about this project every single week year round. So uh, anything you can do to expedite it and get it moving along, we would be great, very grateful. Are there any other questions or comments? Well, thank you, Jeff and Brian. We appreciate you uh, doing the presentation tonight and uh, we look forward to seeing um, that bridge uh, completed soon, we hope. Sir, thank move you. On to, let's move on to item 14A, new business. Uh, consider request from the American Legion regarding veteran related improvements at Stumptown Park, uh, Mr. Tafano. Good evening. I'm coming Good to evening. you tonight as a uh, commander of the Matthews American Legion post. And also very, can you see me by the way, it keeps coming up and saying that uh, I can't uh, start the video. Uh, we see your presentation and a photograph of you or, other, or you're being very still. <laughs> All right, well, well, we'll go with this. Okay, uh, let me try, every time I try starting the video, it says I can't because the host has disabled it. So I'll, I will just continue. All right, so what this is, it's a very positive, uplifting project that uh, really entails every part of the community. And this is a project that goes to the heart of what it is to Matthews to be uh, veteran friendly and support the veterans. Uh, there's a part of Stumptown Park, uh, if you would advance, uh, uh, Lori, thank you. Uh, the Stumptown Park veterans area has fallen into disrepair over the years. And it just is not the place that we want it to be as veterans. And I'm sure not the place that the town wants it to be to present a respectful and honorable tribute to the people that have perished uh, for us and our country. Uh, so what we've done is we've segmented this as a scope uh, into four parts. In other words, the, the vision for this particular park is broken up into what the wall is, and that's where the current uh, rotary wall is. And then there's a garden area, which we'll get into, and a plaza, and also the entrance. Now, before I go any further though, uh, I want to say that I'm coming to you after many weeks of working with all of the departments and the advisory committees. For instance, uh, I have personally walked the park in this Veterans Memorial area with uh, Debbie Foster from Appearance and Tree, Life Fitzpatrick, uh, Ralph Ramsar, uh, Scott Rawls, uh, Tom Cannon from uh, the, the advisory committee, the Veterans Advisory Committee, as well as uh, Howie Lambinar uh, from the Parks and Rec. And then I've had numerous conversations with uh, Corey King as well. So well, I'm coming to you to give you a concise synopsis of what it is that we've been discussing for the last five or six weeks and where we're going to go. So this particular uh, uh, concept is being brought together by actually the veterans themselves, uh, but we've been blessed with having a landscape designer, Lisa Tompkins, which you probably are, are familiar with because I understand she's done some work for the town before. And also we've gotten the arts community involved. Uh, uh, Eileen Schwartz, uh, who's an artist here in town. Expected to be a sensitive military site in Iran. The latest occurred yesterday morning in Western Tehran and caused widespread power outages. As of now, it remains unclear. Uh, that was my reporting voice. I was just reporting on Middle Eastern affairs. So I'll just get right back to the presentation. That was a joke, by the way. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so anyway, uh, we've got the uh, veterans uh, a group uh, that happens to be also part of the arts community. And we've had uh, Don Estes, who's a Vietnam veteran, do some conceptual drawings for us, which you'll see in a moment. But I just wanted to make sure you realize that a lot of legwork's already been done in terms of what we want to do with this veterans area. So uh, if you would um, advance, I wanna talk about the scope of this project. This shot was taken uh, where the love uh, uh, artwork is. And the scope of this project goes all the way from the love artwork entrance all the way up to the left part of the, um, of the current uh, Rotary Club wall. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so on the left is a still shot of the way it currently is. Uh, it's just nothing but dirt and a very soiled wall. And also because of vegetation death over a period of time, there's uh, uh, just viewing the back of the Exxon station. And so this in itself is just as far as a veteran's concerned and as far as someone who wants to honor those that have died for us, uh, this is not acceptable. And so it was because of this and the other sections of the park that we took it upon ourselves as the American Legion to initiate this project. So the drawing on the right is with what Don has done. If you'll advance one more, you'll get an idea of what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, so two feet back from the existing wall, there'll be another wall which will hide not only the uh, back of the Exxon station, but also will serve as a backdrop for five uh, military service flags and the POW MIA flag. Uh, the, of course, the wall will be properly cleaned and restored. And then in front of the wall will be a, a, a paper brick pathway, uh, which is not correctly shown here, but I just wanted to put it here for conceptual purposes, that'll have inscribed bricks uh, for those that have uh, fallen that are associated with Matthews or with a resident of Matthews. So if you can go on to the next. Okay, the next area to the right of the wall is what we're calling the Memorial Garden. Uh, and if you advance, please, Laurie. Now, this area will have uh, monuments that would be informative monuments that uh, children and, and adults could, could travel through. It'll be well lit and give them informative information about each of the major conflicts that the United States has been in in the last hundred years. And so these will be quite large. They'll be probably three, three and a half feet high. Uh, they won't look this way because they're actually three dimensional and the face is at a slight angle for reading purposes. But this will be a very lovely, quiet, peaceful place that people can and understand what has happened uh, with the uh, residents and the veterans of Matthews throughout all these conflicts. Uh, on next slide, please. Okay, this area we're calling the plaza and it entails the flagpole and uh, along with the sculpture that was placed there about, uh, what, a year, year and a half ago. Uh, next slide, please. So in order to also hide the expressway, the, uh, I mean, sorry, the uh, Exxon station, we're putting up a mural wall. Now this mural wall will not have a mural on it until it goes through the normal process of mural uh, decision uh, making and also community input. And, but we're trying to make it so that it, it's always, no matter what we do, regardless if it's uh, contractors or artists or landscape people, it's everybody is from Matthews and they have a stake in Matthews. Uh, can you go on please, Lori? Thank you. Now, right here at the entrance, about the only thing that we're going to do here is to the right of the entrance, we're going to put a wayfinder sign that will be lit at night. And while we're talking about that, uh, the entire area will be redone in terms of 
electrical and also in irrigation. Uh, continue on, please, Lori. Now, the good part for the town is there won't be any funds requested of the town. Uh, everything will be funded by the Matthews Veterans Memorial Fund, and that fund will be administered by the American Legion. And uh, it's going to be uh, supplied with uh, numerous contributions from individuals and businesses. And also, um, one thing I, I want to make sure that uh, I, I give credit the Veterans uh, Advisory Committee has already reviewed this and has voted unanimously to approve it and has already allocated its funds to purchase the flags and flagpoles for the uh, veterans flags. Uh, continue on, uh, Lori. Another wonderful part about this and something that uh, is actually really uplifting and especially in these days and times by gosh we need this sort of thing is where the entire town comes together in order to do something really meaningful and will have a lasting impact on, on Matthews. Uh, one of the things that uh, I am very excited about is Memorial Garden is going to be completed by Eagle Scouts. We already have two Eagle Scouts that have committed their project for this and we have four more that are about to sign up and they will be totally responsible for uh, working under the guidance of the landscape architect uh, to build and, and uh, complete that entire area. And also the artwork is uh, obviously gonna be created by Matthew's residents. So if we can go on, please. What we'd like to do is start construction at the first part of August. We've already spoken with contractors. Uh, we haven't uh, finalized any contractual deals, uh, but we are waiting for uh, this presentation and some additional discussions with Parks and Rec. Uh, we want to be finished by Veterans Day uh, because we want to make Veterans Day a very, very special uh, a ceremony. Uh, not only because of what it is for, but also to use it as the grand opening of the new Matthews Veterans Memorial. Lori, please, thank you. So what is it that, uh, why am I here? And why am I presenting if we've gone through all of this uh, pre-leg work? It's because I would like to have the blessing of the board in order for me to carry on a working relationship that Corey and I have constructed together on how this project is going to unfold over the next couple of months. And I just think personally that it is one of those types of projects that is, well, it just comes along once in a lifetime in my, in my lifetime. And I am just so excited about it. The people that have been at park with me and walk through the park with me. They're super excited about it. And everybody's just waiting to chomp in and, and, and get to be part of this. So I'm asking that you as the board of commissioners vote uh, if, there, if, you, if this is the proper way to do it, uh, to support the American Legion in its effort to work with the town in order to bring this to fruition. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to present this extraordinary project to you and I'll open it for questions. Mark, you uh, mentioned to me an another portion of this would be restoring the flagpole or polishing it or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I have to give you a little bit of history. On Memorial Day, we actually tried to lower the flag to half mast and we couldn't because the tree had grown into the flagpole and the flags, the American flag and the North Carolina flag were so tattered and torn and wrapped around the branches that we couldn't bring it down. Uh, Ralph jumped on, Ralph Ramser jumped on that right away, had a contractor come out and trim the tree back and life uh, had two new flags put up literally within a couple of days. Uh, but there's uh, some polishing up work that needs to be done. The actual flagpole itself, the uh, bronze plaque at the base of the flagpole. There's some 
masonry work that needs to be completed. And also the entire place needs to be cleaned and pressure cleaned. So obviously a very ambitious project that uh, needs our approval to go forward. Um, and I think it would be best to have a, a, uh, a vote or someone to make a motion or if there are any questions or comments on the project first. I'll make a motion, Mayor. Okay, Joe. I'll make a motion that we approve uh, the request from the American Legion regarding veteran related improvements at Stumptown Park as shown in the YouTube link and the presentation by Mark DeFano tonight. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Miller, a second from, I heard Commissioner McCool first. Sorry, Larry. Uh, any other, Hazen, is there anything you want to say about this? Any concerns you? Any concerns from the town or? Corey, no. are you good? No concerns. I mean, we, we've already committed to do some of the stuff like the flagpole and the masonry, but I mean, it's all part of the big plan. So uh, no comments. I, I like this because I think it definitely be an improvement and it doesn't cost us anything. So if it's free, it's good. <laughs> so, um, yeah. uh, <laughs> Mr. Bland. I just want to be sure that Charlie, we don't have to have, this is not something that's got to be noticed or anything like that. We can do this now and decide this now, right? That's correct. I just want to be sure we weren't stepping on our own shoes. No, you, no, that's a good question, but no, we're fine. It's on the agenda, so we're fine. Good. And, and Corey, you are good with it? Yeah, Mark and I've had some, some good conversations. Uh, were provided answers to some some questions uh, recently, and uh, I, we were assured that uh, even though we we have no desire to manage this project, we're comfortable with with them, you know, taking the lead on it. Uh, but just uh, ensuring that we're still involved with with the project and some of the other details, uh, example selection of plants, but those small things sure, sure. Uh, that we're still involved with it, especially uh, Ralph Ramshaw and. Uh, uh, again, the, the plan, he has an aggressive schedule, uh, but there are some planning things. Uh, I guess it will need to be done, especially with the five foot wall. And uh, again, those assurances that we'll have it well designed and, and I guess constructed to the design uh, makes me feel good. Oh, well, I guess if so, we, can, we can keep that promise. Okay. Uh, we have a motion from Commissioner Miller, a second from Commissioner McCool. We'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Bland? Yay. Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Yay. Commissioner Urban? Yes. Commissioner Whitley? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner McCool? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Uh, Mark, I'll encourage you to still uh, work closely with town so that we're in step with one another, but uh, thank you for this ambitious project and good luck. Well, thank you very much for your vote and for your confidence. Good night. Right. Good night. Let's move on to item 14B, consider acceptance of governor's highway safety program grant for the police department, Chief Pennington. You're muted, Chief. All right, can, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. You can All hear right, you now, I apologize. Sir. I, I just said everything I needed to say, but I'll go back through it again. Uh, <laughs> I, I do have some exciting news. We, we met and spoke uh, on January 13th in reference to a request I brought before the board to seek uh, approval to apply for a grant process through Governor's Highway Safety Program. Uh, the focus of that grant is to increase uh, the safety of the town of Matthews through our traffic enforcement and traffic safety efforts. So uh, that grant request uh, that we spoke about on January 13th um, was a partial grant or a partial reimbursement grant, I should say. So it's 85% the first year of uh, staffing. Uh, and in that request, there were, was a request for two additional police officers to focus on traffic enforcement in the town. Uh, but there was a 100% reimbursement from the grant uh, for two vehicles. And if you look at the, the 
the memo you have in front of you, I do apologize. It's two vehicles, each of them costing 35,000. So that's a total of 70,000 for number one. Uh, and then it does allow us to buy computers for the new cars, allows us 100% reimbursement for LIDAR, uh, which is a speed measuring device, a radar, which is also a speed measuring device, uh, and also in-car video camera systems uh, up to in that line item for 12,000. So training costs is also a requirement under the grant that our employees would attend a highway safety um, program training cycle, if you will. So they're going to get additional training uh, in highway safety. But this is a huge opportunity for the town. We have not been awarded a grant from the Governor's Highway Safety Program since 2001. Um, it's been that long since they have uh, put their faith in us to kind of follow through. So I'm really excited about this opportunity here today. Uh, total grant reimbursements, I see that it says they're about 415. My math may be off, but I'll just tell you it's a whole lot of dollars. Uh, it's 85 for the first year for all um, salaries and fringe benefit uh, reimbursement. And then the second year, it is uh, 70%. And then the third year is 50%. I will tell you that then the grant at that point becomes renewable. Uh, the renewal of that is at 50% of the employees uh, for the next three years. And again, renewable and again, renewable. So um, there's an opportunity for us to see this. Uh, should we remain in good graces and do exactly what the grant requires of us and our reporting requirements uh, to see this thing continue on and to help out offset some of the costs of obviously the uh, increase in staffing that we are um, well in need of. Thank you, Chief Pennington. Uh, great job in securing this grant. I think it's from my perspective, a no brainer to, to vote to, to accept it and, and the rules that govern it. I have one somewhat unre mildly related question. The, the LIDAR and radar, um, from a from a safety perspective to the officers themselves, I recall uh, back when uh, Commissioner Whitley was on the highway patrol, there were there were cases of uh, officers getting brain cancer and things from the radar being next to their head all day. Is that still a concern at all? I don't even know if that was an actual concern. I know there was some, some discussion about that, but but these radar units are fully encased. Um, the, the two different systems, so a LIDAR unit is a point-specific target, so it is a laser, if you will, that goes out, hits an item, and comes back, so it is item-specific. A radar unit sends out more of a wave of, uh, of you know, radar to then be bounced back to the unit, so uh, the radar units will be used as, like, moving radar, and the LIDAR units will be used more as stationary-type uh, capturing devices. Okay, it's very late, so I'll stop asking unrelated questions. Are there any uh, comments for, for uh, Clark before we, or, yes, Commissioner Urban? Um, I had talked to Clark earlier and he was to research. He was looking for a number of personnel over the course of the last year or so. Uh, we have four already on board. We're talking about two more. Where's the Delta in, in the big picture for the, for the town's police department and the, and the personnel status? Okay, just to provide a little back story on this. So in 2018, the board approved uh, the funding of a workload analysis study. So the workload analysis study did an in-depth review of our police department and the amount of personnel that we have based on not only just population, but workload, right? Because, you know, a, a number of 2.3, which is the national average, if you will, for police departments based on 1,000 population, we want to look at is that really an accurate number for an agency our size or do we need to look at uh, workloads? So we came up with a 60-40 split. Our officers should be uh, dedicated to 60% of their time to responding to calls for service and 40% of their time as a reactive response to problems within their beats, um, which goes along with this stratified policing model. Under that, that very long um, uh, you know, study that was done, and I did present to the board back then when it was done, um, they came up with, aside from our civilian staffing, they did request and um, recommend a few civilian additions, and we have taken steps to, to fill some of those civilian staffing positions, but they also recommended nine additional police officers to bring us up to an area that our agency should be at for our size, our population, and our workload. Um, with the uh, with the addition of the four officers in FY20, um, obviously adding these two puts us at six. We would still be three down from the uh, minimum staffing that that workload analysis showed we should be sitting at. So th the good thing about this grant is it offsets the cost and the need that the town would have to spend to get us to that number 
that the workload analysis said we should be at, and the state is helping us offset that and assisting us with acquired staff. Right. I could just add, uh, I've spent probably more time than Chief Pennington once with him lately going to various meetings, et cetera. But one of the things we discussed was our inability to do training. Uh, we, we don't have adequate time in the day for our officers to do training. So they're doing training on Saturdays and extra shifts and Sundays. And, and it's really making the job of already stressful job of being a police officer even more stressful. So uh, I know our budget's really tight, but this, this seems like something we should jump on with so much of a, of a grant funding. And, and, you know, in a couple of years, let's find the money, but we're going to need at least two officers, I'm sure. Uh, in three years from now and, and mm -hmm. Clark would probably like to hire a few more so well and since you opened the door sir I'd like to just also push that training perspective we've been talking a lot about our policies our procedures what we need to do with de-escalation training CIT response model training you know our staffing model does not allow us to be to do the amount of training that is absolutely required of a professional organization and to provide the level of service that that, that you guys and our citizens demand. Are we doing a great job at it? Absolutely, I've sat before you and I've told you we're doing it on extra shifts. We're doing it where we bring them in, where we're taking them away from maybe their families to, to get extra training. But um, ultimately this staffing model will help us uh, get a little bit closer to what that workload analysis study showed. Commissioner Miller, you had a question, sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, Chief, um, uh, help me understand on this memo, are we accepting it or are we applying for it? Um, it's a tentative uh, grant approval. Help, at what stage are we in on that, Chief? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and unfortunately, that's the terminology. It is um, the email I got uh, was congratulations, quote, congratulations, the North Carolina Highway Safety Program has approved your agency to begin the next phase. What the next phase is, is what we're doing here today. They require a um, commitment from the town that we are going to fund this because uh, there have been towns that have gotten these grants and, and not funded it fully and ultimately defaulted, if you will, within the grant. And then they don't get to take advantage of that grant. They want a commitment from the board and a signature from Hazen um, that says we're going to move forward with this. That's the next phase. But, but it is approved. We will get this if you guys move forward today. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. I'd like to make a motion. Yes, sir. We consider accepting the Governor's Highway Safety Program grant from the police department uh, to move to town manager Hazen Blodgett to sign that we move for to receive this grant. Had you not made that motion, I was going to ask you to. Thank you, Commissioner Whitley. Do we have a second? <laughs> I want my uniform to make it. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Whitley, a second by Commissioner Urban. We'll take a roll call vote, uh, I think, for the last time tonight. Commissioner Bland, how do you vote? Yes. Mayor Pro, Pro Tem Garner? Yes. Commissioner Urban? Yes. Commissioner Whitley? Yes, sir. Commissioner McCool? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Um, go get it. Clark, Thank go you get all very mind. much. <laughs> Thank you. This means a lot to us, and, and it's our next step forward, so we appreciate it. Good job. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Hazen. Chief gets the credit. Commissioner. All right, we'll uh, move on. We'll be done here shortly, I hope. Uh, I just have a couple items for the mayor's report. I'd like to uh, report that uh, one of those meetings that Clark and I attended together was a panel discussion at uh, on the 7th with New Beginnings Community Church over in Mint Hill. Uh, it included, uh, I was moderated by uh, Dr. Michael Henderson, who's the lead pastor there, and cap police captains Tim Ledford from Mint Hill, Clark, and uh, Johnny Jennings, who's the new Charlotte Police Department chief, who had been on the job, by the way, for six days when he did this panel discussion, as well as myself and uh, Mayor Brad Simmons from Mint Hill. And uh, it was... Uh, community and, and, and race relation, relations mostly uh, targeted or addressed to the police chiefs, but I think it was a, a really nice discussion and I appreciate uh, uh, Chief Pennington making himself available for that sort of discussion. It went really well. I think it uh, made Matthew shine in a very good light. That was a, uh, a uh, videotaped presentation that I'm told was uh, ultimately watched by thousands of people. So. 
Uh, Clark, you did a great job at that, appreciate it. And then the only final thing I have is um, just a final reminder, if you wanna participate in the uh, giving to the Matthews Helping Matthews campaign, a couple of you have done so, if you can get uh, check cash or money order to Lori uh, really soon, like by tomorrow, or, or if it's gonna be later, let me know. If you'd like to participate, of course it's totally voluntary, but uh, go ahead and do that and we'll make sure those uh, funds are turned over to that campaign. They are. They have a goal of 100,000. Uh, to date, they've raised about 65,000. So they're trying to get the last uh, home stretch of, of uh, 35,000 knocked out. That's all I have. Uh, attorney's report. Charlie, do you have anything? I have no report, Mayor, but you do have one more vote, contrary to what you said a minute ago. What's that? Motion to adjourn. Uh -oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> town manager, town manager, do you have a report? Yes, sir. I do have some one thing. So when we when you guys adopted the budget ordinance, we staff we the staff made a mistake. You talked about the twenty five thousand dollars coming out of two line items in risk management and going into Idaho Volunteer Fire Department. Everybody agreed to that. However, the budget ordinance didn't reflect that, and and so the budget didn't reflect that. So. Well, maybe the, the, the budget the budget ordinance may have reflected that. I know the final budget didn't. So I do have the authority to change money within departments, which is two departments. However, I have to make a report to the board. So I wanted to make this report to the board that we are going to transfer money out of risk management, $25,000, and transfer it into the fire department uh, for a while. And then we have a, Lori will have a record of this in the minutes. Does uh, anybody have any questions on that? Okay. Hazen, could I ask you to bring up one more thing? And I, I wanna be totally transparent. I mean, I'm being asked to sign lots of proclamations uh, whenever yeah. deemed necessary, if it's not just something that's a slam dunk like the one we discussed tonight. I wanna make sure that you guys hear about what I'm being asked to sign on behalf of the town and get some feedback. Hazen, uh, do you wanna mention what you heard on your call? Yeah, everything's everything's evolving, and so the uh, county COVID group and on 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 our side, and that's everybody from all over the county, and then Clark, Rob, Becky, Maureen, and um, uh, Tanya listen from the town side. But what came up today was, you know, these cases are continuing to rise, and everybody's trying to figure out what what's you know. And so we hit listen to the health department, we listen to the experts from the hospitals. But the latest idea is to close down restaurants after 10 o'clock. So what they're finding is that uh, if you're a, 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 a restaurant that has a bar in it, you stay open. However, the later it gets, the more people drink, the less they social distance. So one of the ideas was to close the restaurants at 10 o'clock and the breweries at 10 o'clock with, with this idea of get the people back home probably before they drink too much so they don't, they social distance less. Now, I would say as a general, this is not a problem in Matthews, generally speaking. They're really focused downtown, the Epic Center and South End, you know, a lot of young people down there, but they did want us to talk to the mayor. So I talked to the mayor and in, our, in the case of Matthews, the mayor has the right to sign these proclamations. And then I, I think the mayor's feedback to me was, can't we move to, as a county, like the whole county, the city and the six towns, the city's on board with this stuff. I did talk to some of the other towns. Pineville seems to agree with, with this. Davidson agrees with this. Um, Mint Hill agrees with this. It looks like Cornelius and Huntersville are not as supportive of this change. So, um, now, if I could just if I could just make a comment, you know, the whole idea seemed a little bit odd to me because it's like people magically don't drink and act irresponsibly until after ten o'clock, and most of our restaurants are closed, I think, at eleven o'clock. So, you know, just one hour really going to make a whole lot of difference. But, um, you know, I I, I see you know, some, some benefit, but I wanted to get some feedback from you guys. I, I really want to make sure these proclamations and stuff come so fast and they, you know, they, they have literally hours to uh, sometimes to sign these things. So I don't want to uh, 
we don't have time to debate them for three or four days, five days. So we know this may be coming up, and I wondered what your what your thoughts were. I I'm not real excited one way or the other. I you know think it's you know, possibly could help. So okay, but um, does anybody have any comments? I, I do, uh, Mayor. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think we have a whole lot of restaurants open at the eleven o'clock. Maybe on Friday and Saturday, but I know during the weeknight it's not. Most of them close at ten. So that's not a really big deal other than uh, on Saturday, Friday and Saturday night. That's that's the only concern I do. But then anything that we can do to bring this number down, I'm for that because the number, our numbers are, look like they're 11 now, but I'm talking about North Carolina, but you, you see the numbers in, uh, in Mecklenburg County. We are the highest county in the state of 100. But it's the it's the states southwest, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, and, and I mean it's it is crazy. And unless we do all that we can now, and it's just got to come to wearing masks. And you still go out. Me and my wife go out. We stop and just look at people not still not wearing the mask. And that's it's just it's utterly ridiculous for the being the sake of saving their family lives and people are close to them. But uh, I'm, I'm for anything that we can help North Carolina, especially Mecklenburg County, to bring these numbers down. Mr. Bland. I, I agree with a lot with what, what Larry's saying. And I understand, I think, you know, of course, I'm so old that I don't probably particularly like Ken and Renee would probably straighten me out on the thing. But I noticed that when I came back from a ball game, I was coming through Charlotte because they rerouted the road and I had no idea what goes on downtown. I am just completely lost. I guess I'm because I'm so out of it. But at two o'clock in the morning, I mean, you couldn't cross the street. There were so many people in downtown Charlotte. You know, I suspect that's what they're trying to rein in because there is absolutely no social distancing at two o'clock in the morning in downtown Charlotte in South End and areas like that. Maybe that's what it's about. I don't see that it really affects us very much. You know what I'm saying? I don't saying? think it would affect us a whole lot, but it. the other thing I always try to be cognizant of, but I don't want to take money out of our business owners. Right. What, have you heard anything or is it just... I, this just know. came up. I literally heard about this today. And like I say, this stuff evolves so quickly. It's, it's, it could be tomorrow or the next day. They're asking me to sign, sign, sign that to, to agree that we close at 10. And I just want to get, get your opinion well, if, if you guys are for that or against it. Commissioner Miller. Um, being a food service veteran, no matter where I worked, uh, the kitchen usually closes at 10 o'clock and it's the bar after that or limited hors d'oeuvres or snacks. I would be cool with, uh, 10 o'clock, uh, Monday through fr Sunday through Thursday and maybe 11 o'clock Friday, Saturday. I I, as everyone already agrees, it, it won't affect our town too much. Yeah, I, I was on a call today with the, the National Association of Mayors, and um, I believe it was the mayor of Dayton, Ohio, was saying that you know a lot, a lot of these orders and states don't allow bars to be open, but they let restaurants be open. And restaurants with bars are serving as bars yeah, <laughs> they're essentially a bar, and so the bar owners are raising all kind of cane. Why can't I be open when you know this this restaurant down the street's not really serving any food? They're just a bar after ten o'clock or eleven or whatever. Yeah. So, any other comments? With is, I, I'm think I'm hearing a consensus from those that spoke that you know you don't mind if we sign on to that. I haven't. Perhaps we should talk to some of our uh, owners. Does anybody know how late? Our restaurants stay open. Are they open after ten anyway? Well, Seaford runs COVID hours, and they're only open until nine. Okay, I think, I think, I think most of our stuff is closed at ten anyway, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. So this doesn't sound like it would affect us a whole lot. So if I get asked to sign this, I hope you don't have any heartburn if I go ahead and do it. I'm not hearing anybody saying they would. I don't think it would affect us too much. You may want to check with Texas Roadhouse and some of the restaurants along Independence. That's a good point. I think I will make a few phone calls, but 
Yeah. Like I say, this evolves really quickly, and I expect this to come up really quickly, and they'll be saying, sign on, let's go, we're doing it. So yeah. whenever I'm made aware of this stuff, I want to make you guys aware as soon as I can. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I have a motion like to adjourn. I'd like to make a motion. We adjourn this ship. <laughs> okay. We have a motion from Commissioner Willie, a second from Commissioner Miller. We're going to take a roll call vote to adjourn. Commissioner Bland. Yes. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Commissioner Urban. Yes. Commissioner Whitley. Last call for alcohol. <laughs> Commissioner Miller. <laughs> yes. And Commissioner McCool. Yes. Thanks, guys. It was a long meeting. Appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Good night. All right. Hey, Charlie, I don't think I spoke to you tonight. Be safe.